What up, everybody? Welcome to the Smoke and Tire Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Autotempest.com. Autotempest is the place to save time searching for cars on the internet. Why? Because it takes that search entry information that you put in, all your criteria, and it just does all of that for you for all the sites. You put it in once, and then it goes through all the car sites on the internet and brings all that information back into one place. Cars.com, CarSoup, Cars Direct. Uh, uh, eBay Motors, um, Facebook Marketplace, even Craigslist. Auto Tempest brings all of these together into one place. Doesn't matter whether you make a lot of money or a little bit of money, time is money. And if you don't have to do things two or three or ten times, then you are saving money. That's a fact. And so go to autotempest.com every single time you are looking to search for a used car. Looking to sell a car? Autotempest.com's got you there, buddy. They go both ways. Autotempest.com, we really appreciate them. Just keep it in your head when you're looking for a car. We're also brought to you by Dylan Optics Sunglasses, the official eyewear of the Smoking Tire podcast. See that? Awesome pair of sunglasses Matt's wearing in every single car video, and Zach's wearing too, and when they do the videos together... Those are Dylan Optics, and they don't just look different with the matte finish lenses. They are different. I am out in the desert and the mountains for long hours of the day. I drive hundreds of miles a day in the very bright California sun, and these glasses really keep my eyes from hurting and being tired at the end of the day. It's really the only way I can get through my workday. Otherwise, I'm super squinty and my head hurts. It's terrible. We can't have that. So Dylan Optics uh, is the official eyewear of the smoking tire. Go to the smokingtire.com and click on that partners tab. There's the Dylan banner. If you use that, I will send you a free smoking tire t-shirt with purchase of a pair of Dylan optics. Let's go to the smokingtire.com, click on the partners tab. There's Dylan. And if you use that link, I will give you a free t-shirt uh, with every purchase. All right, on this episode of the show, oh, man, I, I haven't talked to this dude in so long, but it is so exciting because he's such a great guy. He's got great energy, great enthusiasm, and uh, I get professionally jealous because we get put up for a lot of the same gigs, and then he gets them because he doesn't curse like me, and he's good for family-friendly entertainment, and I'm not. But then when he comes on this show, it's all gravy. Calling in from his home outside of Atlanta, Rutledge Wood on the Smoking Tire Podcast. We have three more shows in this studio before we get out of here and go to the new studio. I'm so excited! I bet you're so pumped. It looks beautiful. I don't know if any of my haggard cars would ever be allowed to to visit and stay in your new facility, but if they are... Bro, you're haggard. You get the friend rate. You get the absolute... Do you want an L.A. car? Three ninety nine. Do you want? Yeah. <laughs> who, doesn't, who doesn't want an L.A. car? I mean, I'm not there enough to need one. But you know the joy of L.A. is that y'all's Craigslist is like every the full best. on the slot machine you win. Yeah, yeah. If you Or the, the best Craigslist we've ever found is Phoenix. <laughs> um, because it's a combination of dry air and depravity that you're really looking for. You really get the deals. Yeah, you're, not the <laughs> you're not In wrong. In L.A., but everybody you knows what be, they have. Or thinks they have, they have something. Phoenix, you got to be careful because every car there is a potential rolling meth lab. It's yeah, you do have to be <laughs> choosy. Yeah, you don't want to get pulled over on the way home from buying that car because you just don't know. You don't want to you insult really the guy you bought it from for being like, I'm sorry, is there meth in here? Because can you just give it the once over? Because <laughs> it's, like it's got like a messy. <laughs> I don't know what that smells like, but I feel like if I got in a car that had previously been a meth lab in Phoenix, I'd know pretty quick. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You could it, use that swab that Gordon Ramsay did in his restaurant, and it turns blue, and he's like, who's been doing cocaine in the yeah. toilets? The, <laughs> the, <laughs> no, really? Yeah, 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 he's got the swab for that. He yeah. did that on one of his shows. No, my, I, don't, I would guess that the smell of a meth car, it smells like a guy you run into after a three-day Vegas bender, and he's like a heavy smoker. Someone who hasn't showered and been smoking cigarettes for three straight days. That's what it smells like. Well, I bought it. Wait, bought hold on. 81 Corolla. Oh, hold sorry. on. I want to start the show with I bought an 81 oh, Corolla, sorry. but it's the Smoking Tire Podcast on a Thursday afternoon with Rutledge Wood. Hello, Rutledge from the Hello. ATL. What is going Hello, on? My Are you in Atlanta? Are you in Georgia right now? 
Yeah, I'm in the ATL, in, Beachtree City, to be yeah. more specific, the land of golf carts. Yes, if you describe something in Atlanta as Peachtree, people will have no idea what you're talking about because everything is Peachtree. Everything. There's road, street, industrial. Uh, but on the south side of town, we have Peachtree City, which is a planned community that was started in the late 60s, early 70s, that was built on three golf courses. So there is 100 miles of golf cart path that connect the entire city. Oh, that's and awesome. I drove here on my golf cart tonight. I'm at the place where we that's keep all awesome. my cars and my junk. We'll call it a shop, but as you know, as a person that owns a place that is like a shop, that I don't want to defame your real place by calling my car barn like a, a shop. It's called that's, a, yeah, it's that's a, where listen, you don't sell yourself short. It's a shop. It counts. My place is like some other thing. It's not. A, my place isn't even a shop. Your place Dude, is it's a shop. So, it's like Disneyland. I'm so excited. <laughs> you have and to come I see it. Out about, will you post pictures of it? Now, uh, help me get the name. West Side. Collector Car Storage. West Side Collector Car Storage. It is like, what I love is that when I would play Hot Wheels as a kid, and I think about like, I've got 80 Hot Wheels. How am I going to keep all these in this one little space? You've essentially done that, but as an adult, and it's the most awesome and ridiculous thing I've ever seen. It's very I just, silly. I, I love it. When people it's come in good. and they look in the main room and they look up and they just go, oh, Jesus, you're nuts. That's the best part, that reaction. Well, like you were, you basically went like full Mythbusters, but with cars to figure out what can I actually get in here? Yeah. What's going to scrape? What isn't like, dude, that's no one's ever done that because everyone who I don't want to say everyone, I want to say 95% of the people who ever try to do something like that only think of how can I take rich dudes money? And you thought, how can I make a place that actually appeals to people who have rad cars and want to use them and go thrash on them and drive them? Like, that's amazing. It's Thanks, so cool, man. But more than anything, thanks for having me. I, as you know, we've been friends for years. We met at the first episode of we Top met. Gear. We met at the very first. first episode of Top Gear. I was in the studio yeah. audience. And what I love, too, is that when the show aired, you and I were both like, oh, my gosh, I don't know what happened. It was really fun being there, but the show part of the studio looks awful. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it didn't work out on the on screen, but it was a fun day. <laughs> it was weird. And that's one of those things that's hard to explain to people. You know, you being there and being, uh, I mean, you came in with presence and understanding the TV side and the car side of the business. And you knew what a huge task we were up against for, for Tanner Faust and Adam Farrar and I to do that show. A lot of the chips were stacked against us. But doing that studio was funny because... You know, when they sold the show, when BBC sold the show to history, it was like, all right, so we got to make it, it's got to hit these different things. And so that's why all of the takes they went with were the super dry, zero chemistry takes. But And we would basically do those, and then we would go and have fun with every single one. So by the time we got to the end of it, everyone was like, oh, man, this show's going to be great. I had a good time at the studio. <laughs> And then you watch it, and you're like, "Ooh!" Boy. <laughs> you guys got there, though. You guys, they gave, they believed in you enough to let you guys get there, and you got there, which was great. We did, and it well, didn't thanks, take man. that long a, either, right? And you know, it, it's it's if we came out of the gate and pretended like we knew each other, and you should know us, and therefore like accept everything we have to say, like people would just say we're fakes, we're phonies, we're trying to be them. And I think people, it took a little time to realize that we weren't trying to take anything from the UK show. Those guys loved us. They made money off of us. So they were happy about it. But I think it's like when a new, like a new beer comes out, some people are like, it's not going to be as good as this one. So pass. Well, and then yeah. people realize like, oh, well, you can actually like both beers. I don't care. It's cool. And so it just, it took a while, I think, for the audience to grow with us, but you know, for any show now, I love that when people on Twitter are like or, or Instagram are like, dude, this show got canceled and failed. And like, well, it didn't get canceled, number one. And two, it didn't fail. Like, 72 shows. That's a lot. That's a success. Six and a half years. Yeah, that's a I success. Mean, look at juggernauts on TV now. If they get three seasons, it's amazing. But to work for the same people for that long a period of time was, was a huge thing. But I just, I loved getting to meet you. And it was funny because you totally busted my balls. I, do you remember the first thing you said to me? No. It was really funny because Tanner's like, oh, I'm like blushing that you like, remember. I'm like, what the fuck I you don't want you Because You pointed me out in the crowd, which I was like, oh, this guy knows who I am. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Because what's funny is I knew your work. I I'd, I'd read a ton of stuff and watched some stuff, but I had never met you in person. And so Tanner says, "Hey, you were there," and I go and meet you. And I was like, "Oh my God, Matt Ferris here!" This is like it was so legitimizing. Like in the same way, Chip Foose came to the show, and I don't know if you were there that day. I was. Um, okay. Yeah. So here's crazy. Chip Foose, who we all know, like sweetheart, legend in the industry, and way more talent in his pinky than no offense, you and I can ever yeah. muster none, up. In none our taken. Diet. You're totally accurate. And literally his pinky because he uses it for drawing. <laughs> like literally. Absolutely. <laughs> he was there, I don't know, maybe 30 seconds, and he saw a PA struggling to make a go jack, which is like a temporary jack to slide cars on. He saw a PA struggling to make it work, and my man just gets down on the ground and starts moving this Mercedes SLS AMG. He's not said hello to anyone yeah. yet. Like he <laughs> just saw it and jumped in. He can't help himself, so, I don't think. No, it's just like, it's the coolest thing. So there's there's Chip Foose, there's you, and I meet you, and you were kind of, it was funny. You wanted to like me, but you weren't sure if you were yet. Like, you were kind of on the fence. And you're like, what's up? And I was like, hey, man, how you doing? great to meet you, big fan. You're like, yeah, I'm pretty sure you got my slot on the show. <laughs> and I was like, oh. Um, oh, no. Well, well, cool, man. And then the best part was like, you're like, but you know what? I, uh, you're really funny and I like your watch so uh, we're going to be cool and I was like okay fantastic but it was such a funny it was like you wanted to bust my balls but you also wanted to let me know like I was okay uh, like, that's but funny. it was such a crazy like 30 seconds of my life I believe every word of that <laughs> I definitely <laughs> and oh by the way it's not the first time I've felt like that <laughs> <laughs> not the well, first like, or the last. I mean, first off, we're like we've always been in a different group of every other like car person because again, I say this with love, you and I are not 85 pounds soaking wet. No, and no, we're we're, also we're not, interchangeable when it comes to casting agents. <laughs> yeah, right? Like we're we're big dudes who have a good time, who know who they are, and we're not really concerned with what uh little skinny dudes think about it. And so it puts us in a really funny category and so i think very much we always connected on that same space of being like yeah it turns out you can love cars and not look like patrick dempsey or tanner who god love them i'm glad these dudes are so good looking but like it's also okay to just be us but it was a funny like it was a funny time period and then you defended us for the studio in a really kind way that was like, no, guys, we were there. They were great takes. I don't know what jackass Joe does. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll defend that, too. You know what, dude? I'll say something. My wife and I went to the first episode of the Grand Tour also hmm. when they did the tent in the middle of the desert, and it was fucking horrible. It was horrible in the tent. And it was really? it was horrible in the tent, and it was horrible on camera too. It I, it was a disaster, and my wife was like, "Really? I thought these guys were funny." <laughs> she was like, "I liked Top Gear. I thought these guys were funny." Now and she hated it, and I was funny. like, "Oh man, these dudes are gonna have an uphill battle." It was a totally different vibe from when I saw you and Adam and Tanner in the tent, and I was like, "Oh, these guys are funny." Like, and I agree, the editor fucking ruined that first episode, but you guys were great, and I I, I right. think you guys did a great job and and if there was any criticism of those first seasons for me it was that i think they made you guys repeat british show bits and they didn't really have to and they got away right. from that eventually some some yeah. suit decided that i imagine at some point right i think it was honestly i think it was how they sold the show was we'll do these kind of because we weren't renting the name like bbc produced our show as a co-production with history so we were in i think a hundred different languages and probably 120 110 countries all over the world subs and BBC's or dubs, brilliant. subs or dubs um uh both uh, oh, subs over dubs so, for me dude did you, how did you like your overdub voice <laughs> so let's talk about the guy that did my voice in portuguese ah uh, I heard my voice when I, so I went down to Brazil for the Olympics for NBC to Rio in 2016. Now keep in mind, we've got like Bob Costas is there. He's got 24 hour security. Uh, Dan Patrick, who's an amazing guy, Dan's there. And no offense to those guys, but they just look like another white dude there. But 
everywhere we went, everyone knew who I was. Because of Top Gear? Was, <laughs> yeah, was so, so weird. Awesome. Because everyone's like, who's the weird guy that we carted down here for the Olympics? And that's day one. And by the end, they're like, so everybody knows this guy. Great. Fantastic. Dude, getting getting I'm, recognized in foreign countries, isn't that a fucking trip? That's a trip, it's right? It's so weird. Well, especially for there, because the guy who does my voice in Portuguese is very high-pitched, very effeminate, and I learned about four words in Portuguese, and I try to say, like, obrigado, and, and the moment that people hear my voice is the moment their expression runs away. That's so funny. And so I realized... Just don't talk. Like so, by the end, I said nothing. They were like, "Oh, talk here, get a picture," and I just smiled, thumbs up, took a picture. It was the weirdest thing, bro. So, that's yeah, so that's, I gotta look up. The, I gotta look up the Portuguese overdub. I gotta hear what this guy <laughs> sounds like. They got like the it's they got like the queer eye guys doing your VO. Like what the fuck? It's pretty fantastic. <laughs> like it was like, "Hi, Leo," and of course, guess what? Tanner's voice is super low and machismo. <laughs> <laughs> Yo soy kind of fast. Great. That's so yeah, you'd funny. never you'd never watch that show in Portuguese and think, this guy's married to a female and he's got kids. Uh. <laughs> it's a totally different thing. But that's the joy of it, man. It was so cool to see how we do something here. And you know, people watch your stuff all over the world. When someone sees you in another place and says in a way that like, hey, you have value to my life by this thing that you did because you didn't want to sit in a cubicle, like it's mind blowing. Yeah. It's cool. When I went to Dubai and I met all these Middle Eastern dudes at this car show and and because I'm, you know, I've got I'm just Middle Eastern enough, right? I got the I got the arm hair, the tan and the last name. It's just enough. And so I'm like I'm like a god over there cuz I'm like on the edge of the top gear without being I'm as close as you can get and be Middle Eastern. And so they yeah. they loved me over there and and it was it was extremely surreal. You know what I mean? I was like, "Wow, you guys are as far away from me as you could possibly be and are just absorbing this stuff daily. It's wild. Really wild. Isn't that cool? Yeah. I love that y'all went to that that first uh, studio for Grand Tour. You know that shot, that opening sequence? Oh, yeah. The, beginning of the Mad Tour. Max shot? Yes. So just so people know, they spent more on that shot <laughs> than we had our entire last season. <laughs> wow. <laughs> we went all over the world they didn't leave about a 400 yard segment of the yeah. desert and spent more money in that shot than we did in the season. But that's, as you know, like it's, it's, I was talking about my buddy, Jared DeAnda about this. There's like, what up, Jared? We love Jared. J Rod, you know, he kind of said like, how do you deal with those frustrations sometimes of like the, well, why not me? And, and why not us? And you know, like, to be a part of Top Gear now is a weird thing because BBC ruined the brand so much. Chris is kind of the only redeeming thing about and I'm not knocking the other guys. Yo, you know, I thought Chris, Chris the last different. lineup I thought was pretty decent. I liked LeBlanc and Harris yeah. and uh, and Rory. That was bitching. That mm -hmm. was a real good they uh, they really had it going there. And then I don't know, I guess I guess LeBlanc wanted out and now they've got two dudes who I I guess they're football players or something. I've never heard of them, right? Have you watched it? I have not. Oh yeah, so I we don't not. know. But Chris is the I mean, he's the best. He's probably the best at working today at this job right now. Absolutely. And what, what I hope is, um, you know, my buddy Dax Shepard is going to be on the new U.S. version. And he and I met and became friends because he was on the U.S. show. We drove a BMW 10 series. I'm sure you saw every show. So I'll just, for the people that didn't know, I'll tell them. Explain what that a, is. <laughs> we took a BMW 7 series and we welded a 3 series to the roof. So Dax had the steering, which came down in front of me, and I had the gas and brake. And he was so much fun, and I'd always been a big fan of his, but like he drove his Lincoln um, to the set, and I was like, this this guy's just like me, but he's got like a real career, and he yeah. loves cars. <laughs> Dax is so extremely we, legit. He came on our yeah. show and was so beyond legit and Zach and I watched both chips and hit and run and it's like holy shit this guy knows how to film cars like he knows how to drive yes. cars and how to film cars like and he's real serious about it too some of those shots and chips were amazing it, and to also people don't understand how different it is to shoot with uh, one motorcycle, let alone two, and then try to make all of these epic shots happen with the cars and everything else. But 
to to know I'm, here's what i'm really excited about dax i i had dinner in his place in um november i was there doing these olympic shoots and i was asking about work and, and what was going on because kind of every time i'm in town i try to go see him uh, i've helped him with this roadmaster a little bit that thing but is so said, cool what a great car oh, dude it's so fun <laughs> it's funny this last time i got to drive it with the lsa swap and i think it needs a different transmission because it definitely hangs out second gear way too long <laughs> but what i love is that like we drove his roadmaster and i got to just i got to drool all over it and i had a 96 his was like a that came out of i think palm springs had like twenty three thousand miles when he started building it but so we go drive that and then he's like do you want me to fire up the ford gt like yeah, Bax, I think I do. But uh, did he get the, did I'm he get a new is, one? Does he get the new Ford GT? Uh-huh. Uh, good for Maybe. him. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say that. My bad, if not. Yeah, um, I, I don't think anyone gives a shit. Good for Dax. Yeah, he, he earned he earned yeah, money. Exactly. Let him have what he wants. He's he's a good dude. Amen. Yeah. And now he's got his 1990 uh, 454 SS Silverado. Like I just oh, did he buy I, one of those? Did he buy a yes. like a that's like that's yeah that's super white trash. <laughs> <laughs> Keep in mind, I just sold my typhoon that I had for eight months. So That's super it, white trash too. Yeah, yeah, both of y'all. Call the kettle black. <laughs> it's they're ridiculous, but they're about a, a time, right? Like they're yeah. like a time gone by, and I'm so excited for him and what the possibilities of of that brand can be and to know that he's he's going to be the main guy on on the new top gear that that's going to be us version i'm really excited for him i think it's going to be really difficult as you know because the brand took such a hit and such a weird kind of identity place mm-hmm. that any way you cut it when i talk to him about it, i just said dude if someone's going to pay you any amount of money even if it's free <laughs> and you get you get to drive the coolest cars in the world like you ha- as you know you have to do whatever it takes uh, to do that so it helps honestly it, it helps to be dax he's already very rich that's a great position to be in because it's such a fun job but the truth is it on its own it, it doesn't pay very well they i right. i had a few ch- chats about about this version of the show and it didn't really go anywhere but but if you're if you're already financially okay then this is the best side gig of all time you know what I mean? Um, yes. Wait, As can you I know, ask you, though, weird, about... Uh, uh, yeah. No, continue. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. Go ahead. I was saying, it's a, it is a weird... We're, we're in a really weird disparity in this country with cars, and someone somewhere who's not into cars and doesn't know anything about them sort of picks a value of what they think people who have worked in this field and done things their whole life they sort of just arbitrarily pick a value of what they think people are worth and it's way off. And it's tough as you know, like we, this kind of notion of we keep making dumb people famous. Um, it definitely, it definitely applies to this car world as well. And it's pretty heartbreaking sometimes because you and I know we have incredibly talented friends that do amazing work. And some dude that wears a sweater in June low balls them and, you got to keep the lights on at the house, and people got to take it. it. Just sometimes, man, it just is. It's really <laughs> really glossed over the dude who wears a sweater in June, and I just spent the last ten seconds picturing that guy and go, so "Yeah, specific. that fucking guy does wear a sweater in June, doesn't he?" <laughs> dude, we we had a meeting. The three of us, we had a meeting with uh, a major. I'll just say a major cable network. It was Adam Tanner and I, and this was after BBC. It's like BBC anyway. Got it. They just lost their minds after. Um, the UK boys got in trouble. And so they just had a bunch of bad ideas and, and history and us said, let's walk away from all these people. They don't know what they're doing. And unfortunately, like we were right. So that's a bummer, but (laughs) we went and met with this other network and this guy said, there's three dudes. And then the guy with the sweater in June. And he said, I just don't get the fantasy. Like, why do you want to drive all these different cars? And I looked at him and I said, let me guess. Do you drive an electric car? And the other three do like a head turn. <laughs> and I was like, all right, um, well, here's how our show works. Let me guess. Um, all right. So you're not a college female. So you didn't buy a Nissan Leaf. Am I right? And the guy's like, yeah. I was like, all right, uh, you wanted a Tesla, but you don't want these guys to think that you're a total jerk and make too much money. So you didn't get a Tesla. And he's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I said, well, and a Prius plug-in hybrid would honestly, it's one of the best ones out there. You didn't get that because it won't make you feel superior oh my to a normal God. person driving a Prius. <laughs> I said, so that would leave you with the Chevy Volt. 
and the three dudes started clapping. Yeah, that's when they pick your show up. <laughs> well, we walked out of that room, and Adam Ferrar looks at me. He's like, we either got six seasons, or we'll never talk to those guys again. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was the latter, but you, you got to be real with who you are and yeah. what you do. And I, I think that's why... Adam and Tanner, I've always stayed such good friends. And now we're doing like a, a kind of like a rewatch podcast called Speedy Beardy and the Mole, where we sit with people and tell all these stories about the stuff going on. And it's so much fun, man. Because as you know, a lot of times when you're out doing these shoots, like I remember that, um, was it that RX-7, like of death? That oh, yeah. Gen? Corbin Goodwin's zero fucks yeah. given RX-7. Dude, yeah. if we went back and sat and watched all that footage, you would remember so many things that were that you didn't use in there. Yeah, right? yeah, that you yeah. Talked about, like, you have like flashbacks from, oh yeah, it turns out this car almost killed me. Yeah, and yeah. That's what we do with the podcast. And it's just, it's so much fun. Oh, so subscribe I'm rambling, on I'm YouTube. Sorry. You no, no, fun. it's fine. By the way, can we, Zach, are we allowed to shout out Corbin and what he's doing right now? Yeah. Corbin, the kid who built that car, is yeah. now, he just got a job at SpaceX. No, no, no. No, I'm sorry, right? Oh, excuse me. Better. Singer. He's working at Singer. No The dude way. who built cars that he called No Fucks Given now has a job at a company whose tagline is everything is important. <laughs> <laughs> but to in his defense, his cars looked like shit and always somehow handled. Yes. His cars were pretty incredibly. Yeah. So if you well, build the, terrible cars. Jetta, was it the Jetta pickup? Jetta Mino. Yes. The Jetamino is great. Dude, what that, <laughs> first off, every anybody that's watching this, male or female, you need to go back and watch those videos of Matt driving Corbin <laughs> stuff because to know that he's at Singer is so awesome. <laughs> like, that's what I love. Truly, that's what I love about this industry is no one is born with mechanical knowledge and understanding, like, how do I make this power transfer from here to there? It's just time and yeah. it's energy and it's knowledge and it's making a ton of, uh, mistakes and scratching stuff and like dude how rad is Corbin that he's doing that now living the dream yeah and he had such a great attitude about all of it from the beginning and uh and he deserves he deserves his successes so shout out to shout out yes. to Corbin and his fucking gig at singer <laughs> so funny the most slapped together and then the right and it's incredible <laughs> So, um, dude, so to go back, we brushed over it briefly and then and then we took a more interesting left. But I want to talk for a second about what, just if you don't mind, the disparity sure. between the perception of the UK Top Gear budget and then what they gave you guys to work with here in America. Because that, I mean, well, the whole, it was always with Top Gear. It's like, well, if you get $2 million an episode, of course you can. Meh, meh, meh. You know what I mean? And is that is that the reality or is that just the fantasy for three people that weren't you? Well, I mean, it was always the fantasy, right? The hardest part is any way you put it, no matter who is going to be on that show, it was the notion of liking a band before they get signed. And everyone, everyone felt like Top Gear UK was special to them unfortunately it was the most downloaded show in the world like it the secret was out they'd been signed for years but because it was seemingly harder to get over here people had this fantasy that i'm the only one that knows about these guys uh -huh. so they're only special to me you how dare you step on it so <laughs> yeah 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 now keep they in didn't mind, have I've download seen... counts at that time. You downloaded them from Final Gear, but it didn't say this has been downloaded forty-eight million times a week. Yeah, it was just and that was just one site. By the yeah. way, they were. You remember what they weren't? Um, what do we call those sites where people would go? Torrents, torrent like the, sites. Yes, the torrent, torrent dude, sites. They were. Yeah. Everybody's watching that stuff. LimeWire, so, dude. It was all about the LimeWire. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I still I found an old mixtape like CD the other day. But you know, back in like early days of LimeWire and Napster, you could still get the brown note, which kids today don't know ah, about the brown the note. Brown note. <laughs> that was when there was an issue with your download, but you didn't know until you had already burned this onto a CD and you're listening to it at a loud volume, and there is like a ah, and you. <laughs> 
lose bowel control for just a brief moment. <laughs> <laughs> it, was not, it was the worst. I still have to rock <laughs> CDs, dude. My Aston Martin still as a CD player. <laughs> I put CDs in oh, that yeah. shit. I, I haven't bought a CD since, I don't know, 2000. And so I've, I'm listening to my high school shit. <laughs> the six disc <laughs> in the trunk. <laughs> dude, it's, a, it's like such a nice throwback. What I laugh about is uh, there's a, in my Tundra, I have a CD player still. And I leave a, this like big CD case right out there because in my mind, I was like, no one will steal this. They don't know what these are. <laughs> There's a guy on Venice Beach and I walk by him every day and he's this Jamaican dude. And he's, I don't know, he's a rapper or a reggae artist or whatever. And he's selling CDs. He's trying to sell his CDs. on the. It's like, bro, zero people who are walking by you have a CD player. Like, give me a QR code. Give me an iTunes link. Something. Like, what are you doing here? And yeah, they think it's a cup holder. Every day. Every single day. This guy. The weird thing is the guy, like, the next guy down is selling uh, remanufactured Zune. <laughs> tough sell. Those two. Tough, tough sale. All right, so, yeah, the disparity of, of the UK show. So the way BBC works is they are funded by the UK. So they're, the way that they have funds, use funds, everything else, like, they did a shot where y'all remember they launched some crappy car. They hooked it to a rocket. It was a Reliant was like Robin. Their, Reliant Robin yeah, spacecraft. Was, <laughs> that's right. So that was essentially like NASA for them. Well, because it was all technically part of this governmental thing, that didn't cost them any money. When we would go and do something at an army base, it would cost us insane amounts of money, and it would cost the military insane amounts of money. We were lucky that like we went out to Fort Irwin which is oh gosh the the national training center that's some of the coolest stuff i've ever seen and we ran from we tried to run from snipers and we failed miserably <laughs> uh we tried to race a tank we sucked at that like it, everything that we did was just insane but it's it's just it's a totally different ball game so you start with that the 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 expenditures are so weird bbc does this funny thing where they split the money with history and I guess history had the show in the U.S., Canada, and Latin America. And then BBC takes a show around the world, and they package all of these different shows together so that small networks in Brazil, in yeah. France, wherever, will buy <clears throat> not just one show from them, buy 20 shows. Actually, and Drive so on NBC Sports is part of that package, which is how I found myself oh. in South Africa, someone going, Matt Farah, I watched you on BBC. I'm like... <laughs> I think you're thinking of someone else. No, no, it is you. And I'm like, oh, I guess they sold it to the BBC yeah. down there. Okay, cool. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> Very now, weird. here's the weird thing, and I don't mean this. Again, this is just, uh, we're trying to show people a little bit behind the thing. So for someone like that, I assume that you got paid by drive, and then that's it. And wherever the show goes, it goes. Correct. So I do not get points on that deal. Yeah. It's a weird, mm. it's a weird thing that that's changed so much in probably the last 20 or 30 years. It used to be like people could make great money and would go somewhere else where that doesn't work that way. The internet has really changed <laughs> all of that stuff. Yeah. But uh, the other thing that I always thought was interesting is a lot of people don't know that they tried to shoot a pilot for NBC. NBC bought the rights to the show. They produced one pilot. I never saw the whole thing. Do you I mean the Adam Carolla, the Eric Stromer pilot? Correct. So I have seen it. And what did you think? It wasn't terrible. It was a generic Top Gear episode. It, it, it looked when I saw it. Well, first off, I auditioned for Eric Stromer's part and then didn't get it, which I thought was a mistake. Right. And Corolla told me later that he wanted me to. And when I saw it, I was happy I didn't get it, not because anyone did a bad job, but because it really felt um uh, like watching wow. a Top Gear cover band. Now, this is before I had ever seen anybody else do Top Gear, except for the the main right. three guys. So, in having if I saw it today, I might not think that. But at the time, I was like, "Oh, this is a cover band." Okay, got it. Moving on. Yeah. Well, it wasn't so horrible, here's how though. I would. I think that's a perfect way to put it. And so many times, I played in a cover band in college. That's how I paid for my school when I lost the Hope scholarship. But. You know, the thing about a cover band is you're trying to do a representation of what someone else did who isn't here, right? And so what that means is you have to mimic the guitar parts, the harmonies, the drums, everything else. You're not doing an adaptation. You're not – like there's a difference in a, in covering a song and then remastering it and changing it 
And I think that's the greatest difference is I think when they did that show to me personally, when I, the few minutes I watched and you know, Carole's a friend. I, I love him. I think he's awesome. Tanner obviously was, was on there too. I think they probably went a little too heavy and tried to find a Clarks in a Hammond and a May. Yeah. So when I got the call about it and they said, you know, what's going to make this show a success? And I said, well, I know it already, I know the pilot already failed. It, Cause at the same time they did, NBC did like a Knight Rider. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they did. Oh Knight yeah. Rider. yeah. 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 They got Candace canned at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. They did. Yes. <laughs> so it was a bummer because people thought, uh, they thought, Oh, well, if they don't like Knight Rider, they're not going to love, top gear and that's a bummer because it had i think it my guess is it probably had a real budget at, at that point and we work with far less the rest of the time but i do think that they probably tried too hard to find um a clarkson and adam honestly is the, is the closest thing i think this country's kind of ever had to someone um in that sort of a stance with credentials and and to be as vocal as he is about everything in the world that he wants to be um and so i think when when they asked me what would make this show fail, I was like, I can't pretend to be one of those guys. Like if you're looking for a, or a Hammond or a May, like I'm, I'm not it, man. I'm, I like goofy cars. I'm from Atlanta. I cover NASCAR. Like, I don't know what to tell you, but yeah. I, when I went out to the audition and you know, like you've been to auditions that are real. I'd never been to a single one. When they first called me, I thought it was a friend Frank calling me. That's hilarious. So I got out there and there's like, Exhibit was there. <laughs> exhibit. I sat. I sat in Exhibit's car. Delightful guy, by the way. I sat in his rolls because I'd never seen a rolls up close. I was like, "Hey, can I?" Um, I know we just met. Can I go sit in your car for a second? Like, I just want to like check it out. He's like, "Yeah, man, go for it." I sat down and Matt. I was sure in about ten seconds. I was like, "I." If I stay in this car, I'm going to fail a drug test. I got to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and I went. I went back to. He was talking to Bill Goldberg. Was there. And uh, also a great guy. But the whole time I was like, I'm never going to get this show. So I just got to remember, like, who was cool, who wasn't. And I, that way, when obviously I'll watch it at home with all my friends, I'll be able to tell everybody what these guys are like. And then I got the show and I was like, well, I am a jerk. I've got to forget all that stuff. I mean, it's. I think. I think that worked out for the best. I don't think if Exhibit or Goldberg or them hosted that show, I don't think it'd be good. I think it did well, and it propelled you into a career doing other fun shit, like Lost in yes. Transmission, which I was very oh. jealous of uh, in a friendly way. I love you, and I was very jealous of it because it's the closest I think anyone has come in America to a Bourdain-style car travel show and if you go into any network meeting with a guy wearing a sweater oh. in june and you use the b word that meeting is fucking over Dude. <laughs> so I the think weird part is they all throw it out like a weird litmus test like i can't tell you how many calls i've had about yeah we want to do like a cool like a travel show like a bourdain style thing and every time i'm like you can't number one there was only one anthony bourdain and there's yes. a reason like he also, I, sometimes I watch that show and I'm like, who the hell said yes to this? Because <laughs> it fights everything that this like kind of, you know, format and resistance of all this stuff happens. But what I love is I'm so glad you, you mentioned Lost in Transmission. That happened because um, BBC, I was, I was still tied to them. History said, we want you to do another show for us. And I was like, cool, we'll do it in between seasons of Top Gear. And they said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to fix cars up for other people. And they said, like, what? I was like, I said, like, a, like overhauling, but on, like, without chip skill and without that incredible budget of all these parts. Like, let's just do stuff that, like, you or I would do if you wanted to get your mom's car back on the road. And they're like, all right. Um, maybe we can do it. They looked at my contract. First off, this is how, how I knew BBC was rough. History looked at my contract and they were like, you got to get an agent. Said, what? <laughs> they're, they're like, like yeah, they're like receptionist is like, you're getting host. <laughs> well, you know, if the people that are paying you money are about to tell you how bad your deal is currently and they just want to pay you some more money. Oh, you're no. like, this, this doesn't make any sense. And then I remembered like, oh, you, I, I would have, I, and I always tell people like, whatever your first deal is, it's going to be bad across the board you have to do that like that's just part of it because i would have delivered pizzas if it meant i could have been on that show and so yeah it turns out i got paid peanuts to do it over the first few years and then that, and that's fine but we got to do this show and 
the crazy part was the show oddly got higher ratings than Top Gear. It could have been the time of year. It could have been how really? they promoted it. It could have been. Yeah, it could have been a million things. It just that was weird for me. And could I could be to that Adam make... and Tanner were fucking boat anchors for you. Really not letting you. No, fly. <laughs> no, 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 that's kidding. Not in the least, but I knew. I know when you watch. I know I was like, hey, I make this incredible product with my friends. That is what I think is is like a, a nine. And then I made this other project with my friends at home, and I didn't have to leave, and I got to do something really cool for other people. And I feel like it's an eight. And then it got higher ratings and i was like this doesn't make any sense and then it didn't get renewed it didn't get canceled it didn't even get like a phone call because what happened was all the top people these cable networks change or they have in the past 15 years they change people every four or five years i know where this is going you know top part of the pyramid you know they just they go to another (laughs) network and so what happened was these people bought the show love it set a marketing budget everything else and then they get moved to a different network so the show airs and then it's just kind of on this island of success, but nobody wanted to pick it up because so many of these producers say, oh, cool, um, you just hand me that, give me this budget. I'm now a, a big guy at a, or gal at a network and they take that money and hand it to their friends and go right. make shows. That yeah, way. yeah. The so, new guy comes in and they need to they need to put their mark on the network and what anything that was there before, screw them. And yeah, even if it's successful, we've heard this a few times. Oh, yeah. It sucks. It's oh, just yeah. TV. It, it, it's how it goes. It just stinks because that was one of those shows that people still it's on mm. it's still on demand. And I think people realize like you can um like one of the crazy cars we did was an AMC Eagle wagon, which is like one of the most unloved cars. Yeah, I love ever. those things. <laughs> it's at peak ironic cool right now. The overlanding culture, yes. you know, first all wheel drive sedan, really, I think is, uh, yeah. It's it was a big cool. deal, but like we found this guy, Rick, who loved it. He loved it so much he had two of them. I ended up buying. <laughs> His nice one from him of after course the show. You did. Later, but I just thought <laughs> the just meager thought budget funny. they gave you, you burned on crappy cars. <laughs> oh, these are not you expensive. See me. There were so many, and here's one of the things: there were so many times when we ran out of budget on those cars, and I was the one calling my friend's junkyard or calling Summit Racing and saying, "Like, okay, guys, just I, I know, <laughs> but it's he's gonna love it. Let's just, what can we do here?" And yes, I, this is I, Rutledge I Wood from side. Top Gear. Can you hook me up? <laughs> I, I no, this is not a prank. For a Ford Fairlane, <laughs> That's hilarious. And I need them tomorrow. Yeah. How's that it Eagle Drive? You still have that thing? I sold that to my friend. Okay. Uh, it was funny, dude. It drove like a Jeep because it really was. Like yeah. it, it drove like any uh, was the XJ. It was like an early Cherokee, Cherokee, basically, right under there. Yeah. Absolutely. And it was fun, but it was also like, what am I going to do with this? Like <laughs> I, I have that problem. I'm a real sucker for a Craigslist deal, and I will. I will spend weeks chasing a fifteen hundred dollar car rather than buying the twenty five hundred dollar one next door. I it's a oh, oh you don't know bad. what your time is worth. You and my wife would be best friends. You neither of you have any idea what your time is worth. Your time is very valuable. <laughs> there's, you know dude, that. there's some there's you're some a- weird notion about like for for the record, your Aston is a good example. You could have found one that was a manual. But you didn't. Not you in two thousand and five when I bought the car. I've had the I had the car for almost eight years before I converted it to a manual. Exactly, but it's still like there was for you. It was I'm going to take it from this to this. Oh look, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to justify my own spending. I've bought stupid <laughs> stuff. I, I'm an, I'm an, I'm just as much of an idiot as everybody else. I just know what yeah. my time is worth, and I don't spend yeah. three weeks trying to save five dollars. That's all. My wife, my wife has returned bags of potato chips to the grocery store. What? And she makes deep into the six figures. <laughs> it's, it makes no sense at all. Made a special That's trip to return the amazing. chips. She's wow. An idiot. I love her, but she's and very dumb wants, sometimes. Who wants the chips that someone else took home and then brought back? Like, there's a lot of sides know. to that. I'd rather have I'd rather have a, an ex press car in the <laughs> in the fleet. I think. Which is like, where do you rank ex press car with a rental car? Like, what? Oh. Year? Dude, I would take an express car over a rental car because at least the press cars have options. <laughs> the press, Ooh, cars, the press cars have the 18 way power seats. Do you know do you know that one of my favorite I think it's my second favorite Chris Harris story is that he once accidentally several years later bought a press car off a used car lot that was the very same car he spent three weeks absolutely destroying. 
No. Yeah, his mother no his mother wanted a quick estate car, so he found her some couple years old B7 uh, Audi S4 Avant. He bought it for her, took it home, and on the way home from the dealership, he was like, oh, this car is awfully familiar. <laughs> it turns out <laughs> that he found a story that he wrote several years ago called Can You Drift an Audi Wagon? <laughs> in which he completely destroys the rear differential in this car. <laughs> and it's the very same car. It's amazing. That's that's sweet justice right there. <laughs> that really is. It is amazing. Um, how is it that because because you you know the first day we met you were standing on a stage at Top Gear. How did you become you before Top Gear? Well, I think uh, my dad's the reason that I got into cars. Right, he he grew up on Route sixty six outside of Albuquerque, New Mexico. And so by the age of 13, he'd already flipped like 40 or 50 cars and just kept, you know, buying and selling them. So I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama. We didn't have cable, which is amazing because I had a huge pop culture knowledge for someone that did not have cable. Where'd you get it from? Did you just get it later? I think so. I think it was that like I watched everything that was on TV because I knew that's what I wanted to do at an early age. I, I was in that category of, I'm going to stay up late on Saturday Night Live, Saturday night, watch Chris Farley and dream about being on Saturday Night Live. And then my parents watched CBS Sunday Morning where I watched Bill Geis talk to the, you know, the artisanal pencil sharpener or the, the pumpkin patch guy. And I, I The lighter side of the when, news. Yeah, absolutely. Bill Geis and his... Oh, no. Rutledge. We, Billy and I oh. shared a... Sorry. No, it's okay. You hiccuped a little bit, but you're Hi. there. That's okay. Someone tried to FaceTime. I'm sorry. I'm going to punch them later. <laughs> um, Willie Geist is Bill Geist's son. He and I shared a desk at Rio and uh, for the Olympics. And I remember, like, how am I going to tell him? Like, I have to tell him that I'm here because of his dad. And he sat there. He's like, you know what? I hear this so – you wouldn't believe how many times I hear this. And I said it was because I watched Bill Geist always interview people – and he never made a single person feel bad for being who they were. And I love that, dude. Like, you know, there's a million people that love cars and they're on every side of the world. Like they could know a little bit about them. They could know nothing. They could, they could have built it by hand like Corbin or they could have just showed up and, and loved this rental car. So I think it was a little bit of that kind of met with, I went to school for marketing at the University of Georgia. It's the most Go non-specific Go dogs. No, no. Uh, it's the most non-specific like business major ever. And what, I what do they teach you I, in marketing? <laughs> dude, it was, it was Taglines one hundred and one. <laughs> it was really fun. I, I my buddy Jason said senior year, one of our top tier marketing classes. I looked at him and I said, uh, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna figure out how to get on TV. I'm gonna market myself on the TV for for cars. And he was like, oh. Cool. I'm gonna go work at a burrito shop for a while. But yeah, it's fun. <laughs> and then it worked. You know, I just I think it was just I always um, my first job out of school was for country music television, and I did mobile marketing for them. So I went all over the country and did these goofy like side shows, and uh, it was really funny. I was like to you'd way be too in much, like, like the uh, like the outdoor area of like a stadium where a concert was going on yes. or something. Yeah, I know that Absolutely. guy. It was it was the first time I'd ever been to a NASCAR race, and I didn't get to go inside. It was outside at Charlotte Motor Speedway, and it was also a weird time because that's also right around the same time that the Dixie Chicks got in trouble. Mm -hmm. And so here I am, like I'm listening to all my CDs. I brought CDs with me. We're like you know, strung out, lag wagon, no effects, and then tons of hip hop. And there are people that are shouting in my face, how dare you support the Dixie Chicks? And I was like, I don't even own a CD of this. <laughs> oh, yeah, because you, you were. You were CMT. You were the face of CMT yes, that day. To them oh, I was. Yeah. It was just, dude, it was such a learning experience about <laughs> how people connect with brands and, and what, you know, how they, how something means something to them. But how interesting. Um, yeah. You're like, I didn't want, I didn't, I just was giving out t-shirts. I didn't know I was the face of the brand. What the fuck? <laughs> absolutely. Like I'm just trying to get on TV. y'all. I don't, I, yeah. I'll do a top 20 countdown, but I don't know. I don't like Natalie and I aren't friends. I can't tell her. <laughs> I guess it was a weird time. So I, I ended up uh, 
we were getting married at the time or like a few minutes later, uh, a few months later, I came home. I was always flipping cards on Craigslist or, or, uh, you know, like we had a local radio station that did a thing called the trading post. And I would listen to that every day and go chase cards that way. Is but, that literally somebody um, who would read classified ads on the radio station? That's what that sounds like oh, to me. Oh yeah. Cause I ended up <laughs> working at that radio station. Oh yeah. You're like, this is my I dream job. Up. I could snipe this shit before it even hits the air. <laughs> I tried. I tried, and it never worked out. People were so fast. It's like they were waiting in their car, and it was an AM station. It had probably like a half-mile radius. And, dude, I remember I was going after a rear-wheel drive Celica, and this dude pulled up, and he was like, I was here first. <laughs> That's like, so funny. I'm just gonna go. you they would turn on their like, radios oh, and then like race to these people's addresses. <laughs> to buy this shit. There was always a guy. I ended up working at the radio station. I listened to it, but I just showed up there one day and I was like, hey, I want to see how you guys do this. And I thought it would be a good thing to learn if you're going to try to do TV. Like, wouldn't it be cool to understand the radio? And that's how I got like ended up hosting that show. But every day there was a guy who would call and say, I've got, you know, I've got this for sale, get this for sale. Uh, and as always, I got some goats and some chickens. We're in the trade. <laughs> it was the sweetest, man. So that's basically like, that's how it kind of came to be. I, I ended up finding a Craigslist ad for the Speed Channel in uh, January of 2005. Three weeks later, I was at the Daytona 500, and I was like a glorified uh, T-shirt tosser. So uh -huh. I was an on-site marketing rep who would also ride around the campgrounds and get people to come to the, to the shows. Oh, that's uh, a good gig. And, that's a fun gig, was, man. Dude, such a great time. And you got nothing to sell mind, and everything to give away. It's the best. Yes. It's the it was, dude, best. It was, it was, it was like being PT Barnum yeah. at a NASCAR track. Yeah. Just come on over and have a good time. And if Zach, hopefully Zach doesn't find it, but I had a pretty terrible kind of faux hawk at that era. I've kind of grown into a different one now, but it was like flat ironed straight up and super spiky and uh, just, it was awful that's okay it I makes you feel any better in about that same time period i who was a total nobody had an actual mohawk i actually mm. oh shit is that really you <laughs> oh, there it is yep. so if you took you there in that mohawk but you fully shaved off the rest of it that would be yeah. me from roughly the same time period and i'm not gonna lie i got a lot of pussy I got a lot of pussy with a mohawk, much more than I expected you, to. Wait, you had a full oh, I had a mohawk. proper mohawk that was that size, but went my whole head, and I was fat. I was like 300 pounds, and I got a, and I drove a Hummer. It was when I was driving my H1 Hummer, and I got a ton of New York City vagina. I like have that. never seen a photo of and you. And you will never see a fucking a photo mohawk. like that. I'd have to go to my parents' bonus. house to find them. They and then it exist. migrated south into the chops. Then the chops. The chops were good. It fell. Oh. The chops were good. <laughs> you with a mohawk is time. amazing, Rut. That's a fucking great picture. Dude, you gotta own that stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't, that's the stuff that haunts you. It's really of that, the period. That was me. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, the kicker to me was I knew I wanted to be on TV. I didn't know how I was going to do it. And I felt like I kind of snuck my way on there. So a year and a half later, um, I kept telling him, hey, put me on TV. This this guy named Chris Long, we called him Muscle, said, all right, I'll give you a shot. But if you suck, you got to work for me the rest of the year. And I was like, it's a right to work state. What so are these bargains tomorrow. I yeah. keep hearing about? Everyone's made a makes a bargain. I go, give me this shot. Otherwise, I'm going to, you know, feed your dog for I'm, I hear a bunch of people make bargains like these with producers. But it's never happened to me. Yeah. You have to apparently. Like I, I, I don't know how that happens. Listen, record, producers, just, I'll take my one shot and I'll do your laundry for like six months if I fuck up the TV slot. Hook it up. Yeah, let's go. Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll take that happen. Pepsi challenge. Let's do it. Come on. You'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> you have to, right? And so they, I remember I shot this thing at Atlanta Motor Speedway with John Schneider from the Dukes of Hazard. Oh, and John Schneider, yeah, yeah. Great guy. I refused to call him John. I only called him Bo. And I said, <laughs> I, let's say I had 20 minutes with him. The entire time I was on camera, all I did was talk about Daisy and question the nature of their relationship. <laughs> <laughs> and they aired it. They aired it. And get this speed channel, uh, rest in peace. They didn't think that the internet was going to be a thing. Mm. So they never loaded any clips online. And some amazing race fan somewhere loaded that clip onto YouTube illegally. And uh, our first executive producer 
uh, John Hessling was watching in the UK and he basically looked at everybody who'd been on TV or on the internet for cars in like the last 10 years. And he saw this clip and thought it was pretty funny because like, why would this guy just keep talking about Daisy and he would only call him Bo? So that was how, uh, that's how I got a phone call to, to go audition for the show. That's hilarious. Wow. I mean, it works out like that, right? Just some throwaway nothing clip. That's how you, right? you, can, you can get famous like that. It is possible. How, weird, how hard is it to commentate live sports? It seems to like something it's, that's very hard. It's way harder. Sorry, my lights are blinking. That's okay. Uh, it's way harder than people think because you are – you're trying to look into a crystal ball constantly. I, I remember this one time I was, uh, uh, direct TV used to do this thing called hot pass, which was like a driver specific channel. So if Matt, you were racing, it would be me and Zach and our focus that entire night was just on you pit stops, you know, um, how your race has been, you'd get near Seriously? anybody, whatever. And, and then everybody would have their own channel. Yes, they, get but now it get would change. At the time, it was like six drivers. Okay. And so you'd have two people for each of these six drivers, and it would change every week. And I remember one night I got to do that, and they said, so, you know, what should we be watching on this next uh, restart? Because I've always been like the the guy who goes out and talks to fans or, or, or spends time with drivers. I try to always kind of – sense of place is, is, has been my big thing. But when you're trying to comment on a live sport like that, you know, the guy who I was with, this guy, Tony, said, what do you think – you know, what, what's Carl need to look out for? And I said, if he has a bad restart right here, if somebody checks up in front of him, his whole night can be done. Two cars ahead of him, a dude hits the brakes and Carl Edwards loses a radiator and he's out. Called it. And we're just standing there. I was like, oh, crap. Oh, that was awesome. <laughs> I called it. Great. I called it. But now what do we have to talk about? We had nothing. So our channel was done for the night. And I was like, man, live sports are hard. <laughs> It's a real. I mean, it's. See, it does. I appreciate it, dude. It does seem hard. I mean, I try. I've. I sat on the Meekum stage to do live auctions, and even and that was hard. And cars were moving at two miles an hour across the block. Oh man! You know, I got to. I got to cover Meekum uh, when I first went to NBC. And we we're still doing Top Gear. It was fun. They knew it? I was a big car guy, and I, oh my gosh, it's to me my favorite thing about Meekum, and it was probably the same for you. It's like vacation work. It's the greatest thing to be at a place where. People are rolling out essentially like their Sunday best. It's the best these cars have ever looked. They're shined up and they roll across the block. And what I love is that NBC has a ton of people that cover that that are always like, they. some of these cats, Bill has, they know everything about a Mustang, mm -hmm. a Camaro, you name it. But dude, when an E30 rolls up there with an engine <laughs> swap, I know exactly what you mean. Dude, it was, I loved it because every time they threw it to me, they're like, all right, weirdo, what have you found? <laughs> I had the exact and same I, experience out there. It was all, they're like, this is a uh, Tri-Power 427 in uh, midnight metallic blue. And, you know, Steve Mignante's doing his super nerd shit over oh, there. Yeah. And then, like, they had, a, they had me there specifically because there was a run of 90s supercars. It was like 10 cars in a row. And they're like, all right, millennial. <laughs> you're up what are we looking at here you know and i and i and i dropped knowledge on 90 supercars and they had they had nothing it was very interesting they were so and then focused. You, like what i love is that you and i would go uh we'd see like the b6 s4 uh -huh. audi come up and we'd be like uh guys there's 107,000 miles <laughs> 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 and then they would throw back and be like why do you why would you say that i was like i looked in the glove box those chain guys haven't been replaced guys ticking time box. yeah yeah <laughs> right exactly <laughs> <laughs> Guys, clean E46 M3, but it's got, oh, did the Rod Brains get done? No, skip it. Yeah. And they look, they have the most puzzling looks at each other, and they're like, what do these nerds know about these newer cars? Like, like why would you? And I yeah. just sit there and I'm like, a uh, big fan, guys. I'm sorry. I don't know anything about a 427. <laughs> yeah. They're cool. Uh, I know this one thing. Yeah. <laughs> I had to shout out Meekum uh, because we had Frank Meekum on the show recently, and he was yes, cool. Frank's our, awesome. Our connection was a little spotty, and it was a technical struggle because he lives in the middle of nowhere. But on that they show, I talked about how 
I took my wife to Pebble Beach and uh, to the auctions, and she was obsessed with the people that drive the cars across the block, and they could be f- sitting in like a twenty million dollar car, and they're just dead eyed, straight forward, no expression, focused on that task of driving onto and then off of the stage. And she was obsessed with these people. They emailed me after hearing the show, and they offered to let my wife drive the car of her choice across the block at Meekum Las Vegas this fall. That is the Dude, coolest. that's huge. That's so nice of them. <laughs> and so I assume Frank told you, what I love is that your wife picked up on that. That's one of the first things that I was there. I was like, who are all the people in the green shirt? Yeah. Where did they come from? Yeah. How do you get this job? Can I do it? Because it's like menial a, labor, but with such a high level of responsibility for the finance for the for this dude, car. Can you imagine if let's pretend you decide to run your Countach through and some jack leg <laughs> stalls it yeah. going up there? Yeah. It would I can't imagine the pressure. And so many of them are the sweetest folks that I've ever met. And a lot of them are in car clubs and they just they're there. They're to me. They are the same sort of saviors as corner workers. Yeah. At any road course, they are people that are there because they absolutely love it, and there's no place in the world they'd rather be. And they get to drive some really cool stuff. And they're I I can I can tell they're excited, but they really bury that shit. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it can, can keep it real down there until the car goes back outside the tent on the other side. Well, they act like they're meeting a famous person and they're like, just be cool, man. No, be cool. Yeah. Just, just be, cool. be chill. Oh, it's The Rock? I've, I've totally hung out with him before. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hi, Dwayne. Hi. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, can I tell you how much I loved Hyperdrive? Did you? I did too. I loved Hyperdrive. I thought it was a great car show that was devoid of fake bullshit. You had some great yes. drivers. They were good, fun personalities. The stunts there wasn't were crazy. a ton of acting or stupidness. I thought yeah. it was a great show. And I thought Thanks, that man. you had to you really carried the hosting load there. It was like Rutledge's racing school every every episode with you explaining to those other guys how cars work. Dude, <laughs> when, when, when the anti-lag on Fielding Shredder's 2JZ-powered S13, S14 went off and, and Mike and Michael, they thought we were being shot. At. <laughs> it, was, it brought me so much joy. Because, yeah, Bisbing's like, what is that noise? Is that a good thing? And I'm just, okay, so, oh, yes. It's a, it's a great thing. It was what I loved about Hyperdrive is um, Aaron, who's an incredible producer. I had a phone call with him two years before it. I was on the Hot Rod Power Tour and I had stopped in Nashville, Tennessee, because I just remember everything about it. And they described the show to me. And I was like, this is the greatest thing I've ever heard of. But no one's going to give you enough money to do this right. But if they do, please call me. I would love to be a part of it. Yeah. I just, it, it's it's Hot Wheels for adults. And so two years later, they call and Netflix gave them the money for it. And even being there in person, I kept thinking, this is the craziest crap I've ever seen. Because imagine to be one of those 28 people from all over the world, you put your car in a shipping container and like the couple from Germany didn't see it for like two and a half months. They didn't see their cars until they showed up to beautiful Rochester, New York. <laughs> to a to factory. The old factory. <laughs> yeah. And, Keep in mind, none of them had any idea. Uh, Brittany Williams, her and her husband, Kevin, do some really cool stuff. But, like, no one knew truly what they were signing on for. And I thought that was the fascinating thing to see it because I've become friends with a lot of these people, um, whether it's Aaron and his ridiculous RX-7 that was the only rotary there, Brent Percival, the dentist from, uh, from Kentucky. I mean, it was the greatest assembly of people. And to your point, there wasn't – fake stage drama there wasn't all of these things that we all hate so much about other shows the bummer was the cost was insane insurance alone I <laughs> oh my God. God. yeah yeah i, I can been. imagine yeah we've and, and i've then, met a few drivers from the show uh we met axel uh axel, axel francois, francois who was an oh, awesome what a great guy. fielding um shredder came on the show he drove his yeah. nissan to the studio and he was great fun um, I thought there was such a great uh, presence with all those folks on the show, and they managed to show the the drama of motorsport, you know, deadline or fake anything. Um, right. ACP did such a good job 
um, and he those really guys did. with the with the course. And I thought it was really interesting how um, if you don't know anything about tv and how reality shows work reality shows all they're not fake right but game shows but they need an equalizer that really levels out in this case literally levels out the ability and and equalizes the cars and they built this crazy bridge thing called the leveler which you know impossible to practice impossible to set your car up for probably the hardest fucking thing anyone's had to do in a car in a long time or trickiest had to be ever and the biggest bummer dude is that i i don't think we're ever going to get to see it again it may happen isn't you don't think so i just i think it costs so much money and i definitely think you could do it in a smaller scale but it was you know they shot it in a place that didn't have any tax incentives um, they could have saved 30% probably of the budget if they shot it here in, in Georgia. But um, I think what was so cool and what translates around the world is these people in their own cars on a course they've never seen before. And like just the moment when they think, oh, I kind of got the feel of the leveler, they just move the ballot point. <laughs> yeah. And it wrecked everybody. Yeah. Like, what? When Atsushi Taniguchi didn't let the the – the basically the like the, the part of the bridge that has to drop back down like the safety latch he didn't let it go all the way and that's why it ramped that toyota up there dude that was the most epic thing to watch in person because you're also fearing for his life like is he just gonna go off the side and pancake <laughs> that thing you have no idea but to watch and and fielding is a buddy that that i've become good friends with and somebody that i hope has a career in in the automotive world for the next 20 years because he's a great driver. Um, He's wonderfully well-spoken. He's a kind person. Watching him go head-to-head against Jordan in that Lamborghini was the gnarliest thing because Fielding was in third gear flat when he went through a shipping container and the car basically just I remember that he jumped all the way through a shipping container with like two inches clearance on either side. It was gangster. Yeah, I remember it's, the, that. it's the gnarliest thing I've seen anybody do in a car yeah. in years and years. And it was in their just own car. he didn't want to lose. <laughs> in his own car. Yeah. I'll do that in someone else. I'll do that in a press car. No problem. Right. Yeah, give me well, the I kept trying to get I tried to get ACP and then the producers to let me take ACP's car out because I wanted to at least try. I wanted to know what the leveler feels like on there. Because how can I explain to other people what it's like if i haven't done it and they're like no we like insurance is so much you can't even sit in that car dude they didn't let you have the a wrong go? person no which oh, is why i started to build bro. i've started to build like a, a car in case the show comes back at my friend's shop called coru works in atlanta uh i'm building a 1jz twin turbo powered 94 toyota pickup so yeah hopefully- Hopefully we'll get a chance to. It's got an S14 rear end, so we did a rear subframe. Oh my because I god! Couldn't, you know, like as you you've driven some insane stuff with a live axle. It's not. No, you don't. Greatest. It's not good. It's yeah. not good. No, it's not I, uh, at all. But dude, I can't. I, I can't believe that they didn't let you have a go. The whole course or just the leveler? Anything that because it was just it wasn't in the cards. Oh, they that's infuriating. That's so You're it telling me so mad. I was on Craigslist trying to find a flat box <laughs> car to just take it out there because I think that's what if people don't know what was so cool is that they were trying to combine autocross drag racing, um, you know, a little bit of stunts. It was trying to be every side of automotive yeah. thrown together, but mixing it up in a way that people didn't really know what was coming. And that's I think what was so impressive. And I love the people like, as you know, we got haters for anything, but people were like Oh, stupid! That guy with the Corvette—he just ran the pole. That guy with the Corvette, um, that guy Mike Pettiford, it was the winningest SCCA <laughs> driver in the country. He, for the record, was way faster between the events, like uh-huh. to get from one thing to another. The transit he, he smoked everybody was insane. But he spent his entire life trying to not get the car out of control and 
for half of these things, that's what you had to yeah. do. The drifter. I mean, the drifters really have the have the advantage with this kind of stuff. For it was that, fantastic, and I and did. and I can't imagine having done stuff on camera in a car at night before. There is oh. absolutely nothing worse than trying to drive a car with those lights in your face. You cannot see. You can't see anything. It's terrible. The only way to make it worse is to add water. Add water. Oh my God. <laughs> Dude, add water. Axel, Axel Francois, there's one point where it seems like his entire windshield is just souped over. And then, because the engine was so hot, it was like a light switch. He just couldn't see anything. Oh, it steamed. Yeah, it steamed off. It, oh, steaming it off. was so bad. And I looked at those guys. I was like, I don't know how that car is still running. So who, at this point, like, I don't know, just... Keep yeah. going. I mean, have you ever seen someone limp a car? That that S thirteen had a BMW like a three twenty five swap with a homemade tractor turbo kit on. It was the most gangster together car, and he ran it the whole time. And here's why he's so cool. We saw him one night. There was a party. We had like two days left, and everybody could go work on their cars or whatever. And I was like, "Hey, man, uh, do you uh, do you work on those rings? Did you, you know, did you do anything?" He's like, "Oh no, I decided to just sleep with my fiance all day instead." <laughs> uh, I, I hung out with him. At, I hung out with him at Willow Springs for a day, and that really adds up. Uh, she's a drifter too, and he had bought a base C six Corvette. Corvette, and he was just road tripping it from California to wherever, ending in Florida. He blew the engine <laughs> a, a month after he left Willow. <laughs> Somehow, like he drove it at. at uh, What's it called? Uh, the Valley Raceway, whatever. Like a gingerbread, Ch- ginger. Oh, yeah. Like he slid it off the road. He's driving. He d- he was drifting with no hands on the wheel, with his foot out the window, with me riding right seat, and then transitioning to the next corner, still with no hands on the wheel. And he was just like, "Oh, I just wanted to buy the most American car and do it. This is American dream." So I'm just tra- traveling, Fuck, and then he crazy. pops the motor, and then he replaces the motor and keeps going. Like the guy's dude, a beast. Because he, he yeah, he, he did that same drift week that fielding did and yeah i think what's so cool if you look at the the kind of ripple effects of that show um stacy may who i know y'all remember from the very first show and kind of leading it in a second who was the sweetest thing like she'd never left the country um she's sponsored by monster now and just so you know like oh is that the Matt, one with the can, with the e30 was that her yes yeah and the and she looked up. so promising Dude, and then and then she blew her motor or something right or broke her, her car dad's there yes and like here's why this show was so real and why i wish it would come back i remember one night we would get like 20 minutes it, it, it split up into five minutes or two minutes depending to see the driver and say hey how you feeling tonight are you ready anything you're worried about and stacy came in one night and she just looked totally shook up and we said like hey is everything are you okay? Are you nervous? Like, how are you feeling? She said, I just, you know, my mom and my sister didn't have anything to eat last night and we're here staying in a hotel and I got to go to New York city two days ago. I just, it doesn't feel right. And you're like, man, she, her dad sold his tow truck so they could come there. Like it just gave you such perspective oh, for wow. that's crazy. the fact that, you know what I mean? Like all over the world, people love cars and they want to follow their dreams and do the things they want to do. But seeing that kind of ripple effect and seeing her sponsored by monster in South Africa, uh, Axel has his drift school, but he's, I think got a full-time sponsor for European drift series. Uh, fielding is one of the most sponsorable dudes out there. Uh, Farouk Kauai, is going to run FD this year, I think. Um, what about that Brazilian kid, uh, Diego uh, Rivera? Was that, dude, his, name? Was that dude, his name? Diego Iga is it, Inga, Iga it, Iga Diego Iga. Yeah, that's his name. Sorry, who's Diego dude, Rivera? Is that a baseball player? I think that's a baseball I think player. It so, might be. <laughs> Sorry, watching <laughs> Diego. Diego is so good. Like I would sometimes send videos of him to Tanner and be like. <laughs> <laughs> This kid's twenty one. He's smoking your ass. Like it was, it was, it was so wild to watch. He was like watching the drummer of a punk band that doesn't sweat. Uh, Just, wow. <laughs> well put. Yeah, you, yeah. You couldn't wrap your like. There used there used the band Homegrown used to have a drummer who I would watch him and it was almost emotionless. And he was one of the fastest drummers I'd ever seen. That's what watching Diego was like. Was just he was just next level, you know. But like, how cool that Netflix put that out there and did something that crazy. And I don't know if we'll get to do it again. I hope we will, man. It was, it was bonkers. The international reach of it and, and the variety of cars yeah. was so like, I'd never seen anything like that before on television and it, and even on the internet. It was just people showing up with chargers, old chargers, V6 Mustang, 
race car Lamborghini, like everyone really solving the same problem in a very different way. Yeah. It was really, really cool. Sarah Harrow? Sarah Harrow did more for the V6 Mustang. Oh, dude, than that chick mobbed. Alive. She mobbed a stock V6 Mustang. She was like real good. That was her daily driver until she got the show. They pulled the interior out and welded the diff, and then she went. Like, it's. <laughs> That's awesome. It doesn't make any sense because she smoked dudes that had way nicer cars than yeah. her. And, and I think um, uh, you said the guy with the Charger. Oh, yeah. Alexander Claudan, I think is his name. He's building a uh, DeLorean map that oh, he's going to try to drift. Ugh. It's he's so fun to to follow, but yeah, all these different people. That's gonna not came, work at just, all, by the way. <laughs> I know it's gonna be insane. Have you seen the self Do you still have yours? No, I sold mine in um, oh, what was it? F- f- Twenty fifteen, probably a while ago. Okay. I made good money on it though, so I I did oh, I did nice on that car. I learned, and I, people have heard me say this before. A friend of mine made me a a painting of it. Uh, of a photo I took of it that hangs in my gym at my house now, and I learned that uh, it is equally satisfying to own a painting of a DeLorean as it is to own a DeLorean. Um, it's it's oddly <laughs> um, as expensive yeah. to own a nice painting of it. It's man, what a what a crap box. We fixed one up. You probably saw that one on uh, on Lost in Transition. I do remember and that just, one. It was the most. It was the most heartbreaking thing. It's. It was like I bet you felt the same way. It's that whole thing of like, don't meet your heroes. Mm. I think for us as kids, like that that car and Michael J. Fox were the greatest thing I'd ever seen. It's, it's one of the reasons I loved Toyotas when I was so young. Because like of the that truck, black, yeah. Oh, dude! Do you see the replica like, that just sold on Bring a Trailer? Like the f- exact replica just sold for like fifty yeah. G's on Bring a Trailer. No, you're right. DeLoreans are DeLoreans are fine if you accept them for what they are. Um, yeah. But but they can't be made into anything else. And if you start with a bad one, it will cost you way 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 more to make it average than it would just cost to go buy a great one. And like in LA, yeah. we have two types of driving. We have Grid, light to light, 100 yards at a time, idling, hot, and then we have bombing canyons with aggression. And a DeLorean is good for a four-tenths cruise, which is a condition that we don't have in this city. <laughs> <laughs> It's good for neither of the ones that I've mentioned Correct. for this area. Those activities are not what this car will do, and so I, it had to go. But, I, you know, I really liked looking at it, though. It's such a – the shape is still very appealing to me. But when I go in the garage and see the Countach, and it's even more rewarding, especially because it drives even better than I thought it was going to drive. That's what's very important about that car. Well, I'm going to show you this because I feel like you would appreciate it. Mm. Um, I once owned – I'm going to call it like a cousin uh, to that vehicle. I own. What, are, what is a that? Brickland. Is that a Brickland? Did you actually own one of those? I owned a Brickland and I, all I have left is the keychain and the, it was the best thing. The best it. part. Um, <laughs> I like that keychain a lot. That's a great keychain. What an abomination. A friend of mine gave it to me and I was like, oh, this is cool. This is like, yeah, this is how one happened and then the other because everybody told me like, you know, DeLorean bought. Uh, the rumor wasn't whether it's true or not, but DeLorean essentially got all the plans for the doors. It was like, cool, I got to make these better because they used like this dumb air ram thing. It was a cool notion, right? Build yeah. a safe sports car, but it sucked <laughs> so bad. Similar wheels. The Delo- they, shared a, they shared this sort of turbine wheel design, but yeah, that's, yes. it's an ugly car. It is. Can we go, garbage. Zach, pull, pull up uh, Rutt's uh, little fleet. You know, we had a picture of Rutt's. Is this a current fleet lineup, Rutt? We've got oh, Charger. Man. We've got a Camaro. I see your your Tundra, the Scion XB. There's, There's like a, a Hudson, maybe. A Jetta Ute. A Jetta Ute. <laughs> <laughs> yes, your that old was, uh, We built that Jetamino on uh, on Lost in Transmission. For the record, I mentioned you and the one that you drove in the show. It didn't make it, but oh, thanks very um, much. Because I was like, hey, if we can make this not look like the one Matt Farah drove, uh, <laughs> we're gonna be cool. Like he can't lose. So some of those are are um, I own two of those still. Uh, my dad bought my brown Tundra, the yellow Tundra, the two door up there. I sold. It's in Canada. That awesome Scion XB, that's the one that my friend Johan built, Yo from Rogue Status. It is in uh, California with my friend Victor from Emergency Hookers. 
Oh, I know uh, Victor from the emergency hookers. You blow it, I'll tow it. Amen. The best <laughs> slogan ever. That yeah, that's so a, that, he's Pop a flat. He's a flatbed guy. <laughs> yeah, he's awesome. He does all, all sorts of uh, production and tons of um, racing stuff. SEMA, you name it. Victor's man, but. Um, that car was built by Papadakis Racing. So Stefan built that with Yo. I forgot for Stefan built that Rose car, didn't he? How yeah, great dude. is that? It's got a 2J. That's a legit, a legit rear wheel drive Scion with a 2J in it. It's yeah, it's it's awesome. nuts. Tony Angelo drifted it before uh, Tanner drove it on Top Gear as a taxi. It was so much fun to like, you know, there's still a fuel cell behind the back seat. And my kids were like, Dad, what's that smell? And I was like, <laughs> That is that a wrap on back. it? Well, it's originally orange or something, right? It was like a um, battleship gray. Oh, okay. Yo was dude. Uh, Yo always crushed stuff, and he was such a trendsetter. That was like that kind of battleship gray before anyone had done anything like that. Um, and it was dude. He did so many like Bull Run rallies. Had a bunch of. I remember it from uh, Bull Run somewhere. 2011, maybe or 2012, maybe I think. Yeah. Because you bought yeah. it right after that, right? They did it. They did the rally, Correct. and then you bought it afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was 2011. Um, what's uh, what's in the Rutledge fleet at the moment? Um, still big Toyota guy. So I, I, you remember the old van wagons? I bought an 84 van wagon. Oh, of course wagon. I do. Yeah. I yeah. don't know why, dude. I look for one forever, and it puts the biggest smile on my face. You mean like it, a Tercel 4x4 wagon? No, this is like the actual minivan. Oh, Some the space call van. It, yes, the space van. Oh, a lot yeah, of people yeah. Call it that. yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, I feel you. I have a Delica, so I know about all about yes, '80s vans. You yeah. know, yes, yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> and man, I I've gotten so close to getting a Delica so many times that just I can't. Here's why I don't get it because they didn't make any double doors, and I can't take my kids to school in it because they will get out on the wrong side. And so that's, I, I got to wait till they're older. But, I understand. Um, yeah. If you have yeah. young kids, maybe not, but I mean, I'm using my Delica as an airport shuttle and that you get out on the wrong side, but people are so charmed by it. They don't give a shit. <laughs> so oh, there's like, this is the coolest minivan of all time. Oh, yours is yeah, great. There it is. I no, I love yes. my Delica. My wife is using it as a daily driver and we put fifteen fifty two wheels on it and a good Clarion stereo and that's it. It's mint. It's got 40, 44,000 kilometers on it. That's all. Yours looks That's great. Too. Well, thanks, man. Yours I put some, uh, some old school JDM Volks on there, Continental tires. I got a Magnaflow exhaust coming oh this my week. God. Wow, Magnaflow exhaust. How much power is that going to add? <laughs> it's, I'll be honest, that is a 90 horsepower uh, forklift engine in there now. So even if I get 92, 93, I'll feel a difference. Yeah. Is that it's it's gas, right? It's not diesel, it's gas. Correct. Okay. Correct. We should, I'd love to have a drag race. The Delica has an eighty seven horsepower, uh, hundred and forty oh, wow. pound feet of torque, non intercooled turbo diesel. Hmm. Could be wow. a good race. And what's it, dude, what's it top out at gear wise? Uh seventy nine miles an hour is the dead to nuts sure. top speed. <laughs> and it feels that fe probably feels like a hundred that thing doesn't it? dude you know what I, when i first got it i was like ah, ah 75 is like not so bad this is okay it's like no big deal because I, I put new shocks on it so not like upgraded but or oem and right. yeah it's fine and then i had to panic stop from 70 <laughs> oh dude and you feel bro, like you bro my rear wheels came off the ground <laughs> i endowed the fuck out of this thing it was, ah, it was so it. shady it was so shady and i'm like oh dude no more highway trips in the delica <laughs> It, because if you've not seen one and, and people who don't know have seen one up close, they are essentially the same sort of a style of, of body over wheel that like an early Volkswagen bus would have been. So yeah. when you panic stop, you are above the front axles and essentially your face will hit the pavement before almost anything else. Except unlike a Volkswagen bus, you're sitting on the engine the engine isn't in the back anymore, so you have all that weight in the front, man. It's, it's a real charm. It's a charm machine. I also have a miniature uh, Japanese K-Van, which is just oh, a shrunk-down version. Yes. Uh, it's a 91 Suzuki Every. That's probably my daughter's favorite thing I have. I got that from... Uh, Japanese classics in Richmond. K cars rule, uh, and it's man. So much fun. I drove a Honda City, which is just the Honda version of the same thing, basically. And it oh was, yeah, it was it an, an Acti Honda an Acti, Acti City, yeah. right? Yeah, it was great. It was the coolest, man. I love K cars. You can get there is so much value 
to be had if you are willing to sit on the right side of the car. So much value. Absolutely. Have you, had a, have Absolutely. you owned a Skyline before? Uh, I have not. I I am about to be the proud owner of an R33 GTR, oh, though, from yeah. our friends down at Sean Morris. Oh, and congratulations. Vehicle. Is it still here? Is it still in L.A.? It is on a boat. It's on its way over. Is it coming directly um, to you or is it stopping in L.A.? It's going to stop in L.A. Do you want to go drive? Can I have a go? Of course. Do you mind? Really? I would love to have no. a go. I've never driven an R33 GTR. I would love to try yours. I and did you ever own a 32? I had a 32 bone stock and okay. I loved it. I love amazing it. cars. Amazing right? cars. And yes. I think it was because I idealized the 33 and the four so much that I had just kind of mentally said the 32s are cool, but I just I feel like it's too old. Now underneath, they're just not that different. No, it still feels like the same rocket ship. But you drove a 32, you know, right? I, Have you tried a 32 before? Yes, and I'm, I and I almost got one, but um, the last time I came out to visit Tanner, uh, we went and drove Sean's R33, and dude, I just love it. What a what a tremendous car! So the one that's on its way that Brian found for me is the Midnight Purple. Oh, that's so awesome! <laughs> is it stock or stockish? It's pretty close. I think it has an exhaust, and it's got some wheels that are definitely like you know. It's funny. Japanese style can be so hit or miss, uh -huh. and I think it's close. I think a set of R34 wheels on them is yeah. perfect, or but also T's like T's or whatever. I mean, there's any, there's an, any number of wheels look great on those. It's not an easy one. T37s or BBS LMs, I think, are yeah. what is bound to go on there. But yeah, um, yeah you can absolutely go, dude. I'd love to have a go. I've driven I've driven a bunch of 32s. I've driven a bunch of 34s. I've never tried a 33. Um, it's they're, I'm so excited. Oh, I'll call, I'll call Sean. I'll tell him you said it was okay. okay. Thank Let's you. Now, Yay. I want the, um, there's a great group of guys called uh, Detail Union. I don't know if you saw, I went out to visit Tanner, like, I don't know, eight months ago, nine months ago, and his old Raptor had one of those vinyl hood decals on it, and I was like, dude, this looks like crap. we got to pull it off. And it looked like Edward Scissorhands <laughs> went after it when I was done. Oh, no. And so I basically begged on Instagram, can anybody help me? Um, and these awesome guys at Detail Union are like, dude, we got you. And they went and scooped it up. So I am going to send the car to them and pay for them to get it all cleaned up okay. first. So I think we should make it pretty. And then, yeah, you go beat on it. All right. We can also store it at Westside Collector Car Storage and ship it out from there if you want. Oh, Hercules. Yeah. Hercules. Yeah. <laughs> we get some shots of it up on the lifts. It'll look cool. I can't. I, nothing would make me happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. We're happy to. Rudd, are you more, like, looking at your garage collection, are you more into, like, weird quirky obscure just kind of things that make you smile and laugh versus performance cars absolutely i mean i think it's always been a, a kind of a mix um like i i've been building a mark IV supra for two years and i don't know when it'll get done but um so i always have my heart i think i kind of one foot in that but also i just love things like that 53 plymouth um that you see the picture there that's the one that i built um with Summit Racing, my friends at the Kenwood Rod Shop, who we did Lost in Transmission. Mm, um, that was the first thing I ever did with Randy. And that car is for sale at Streetside Classics in Atlanta. Because I loved it, but I just don't I don't drive it enough. And I feel like it's so cool that someone who wants to drive it every day needs to have it. So I, yeah. I think I just kind of do that thing where I, like the Typhoon, I always wanted to own one. I got one, and I was like, all right. Was that, was that, uh... Was that a rewarding experience to own the Typhoon, or was it just kind of like checking off that box for a minute or two? I think maybe both. Like, it, people always said, like, why'd you pick all these weird cars during Top Gear? Dude, I picked every single car I ever had on the show, and I picked cars that I wanted to drive and spend time with. The Typhoon, on paper, is the most Japanese-inspired um, kind of muscle truck. That and the, the Cyclone. Yeah. Um, that we ever had. And I just love that thought of less is more. Let's put a turbo on it. Let's make it go out there and fight. And when Remember the new, magazine dude, cover? Were... Remember when it beat the 348 to 60 yes. in that magazine cover? That was some iconic shit right there. Man, did GM ride Absolutely. that one all the way to the bank. <laughs> and for me to be, you know, to be 10, 11, 12 when that, when that was out and stare at it and look at it and think like, man, one day I'm going to own it. And I, I commented on somebody's Instagram. Someone said, uh, you know, I've been looking at Cyclones all week because uh, I saw one at a car show and I was like, dude, I've been looking for typhoons for years. And one person saw that comment 
And he was like, oh, here's a great one that's for sale at this dealership. It came out of a collection in Texas. Uh, and two days later, it was on a truck to me. And I was like, what just happened? <laughs> This but, is, I don't but, think this is supposed to go but that to way. to actually get, get it, it in, like, I, I imagine once you're actually in it and driving it, though. Like, I've never driven a Typhoon. I love the attitude of a Typhoon. Same yeah. way I love the attitude of a Grand National, and I drove one. I was like, oh, God, what a hunk of shit. Dude, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> yeah, did you thing. hit the brakes? Is that the moment when <laughs> yeah. you were like, this car is not what I thought? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, I mean, if exactly. you're, I'll be honest, if you're not religious, I don't think you should own a Grand National because you pray every <laughs> time you hit the brakes. <laughs> but just was the Typhoon the interesting feeling. in any way to drive or is it just kind of an old truck at this point? It's To me, it was um, oddly one of the cars that more people ever spoke to me about ever, probably because no one ever sees them, right? Yeah. Like that is, I think, why the people that love them, value them, um, the way they do, but it rode like any um, 80s GM that had an odd amount of power. Yeah. <laughs> the, wor- the worst example, the most extreme example of that I could come up with was a couple of years ago, I went to Texas and drove a 1987 C4 Callaway Corvette twin turbo Ooh. that had a stock suspension, stock brakes, oh. and it had this engine <laughs> that made 575 horsepower at 5100 RPM, which was the red line. It was like it was like a Dude. diesel, like a Cummins diesel in this floaty <laughs> C4. It was so absurd. And man. Those are, you remember, I think you and I were probably the same people who would like, oh, oh I'll go to the grocery store with you, mom, and then I'm just going to go read. Yeah, the like, car magazine. DuPont Registry. Yeah. And, Look at this. and Here dude, those Callaways were the stuff but holy crap when you look back at it now you're like we have come a long way yeah. in a short amount of time yeah well i drove the new the new callaway it. that arrow wagon thing which was real fast <laughs> it was like 775 yeah. horsepower or something it's it's just crazy how quickly we have adapted and like my ctsv wagon is one of my favorites uh and and i feel like that's the one that i'll never sell but i bought it because i drove one on top gear and i was like this is it i couldn't afford what they wanted for me you know the six speed guys i get it it is really cool to have a manual that and i'm not a huge fan of gm as a whole but that particular transmission when it's working is so fast and in that car like it's an awesome ride it's not worth the extra 15 grand that people are tacking on to just have the kitschy thought of a manual but that car to me is like the remade uh, Buick Roadmaster. So I, I just feel like that's one I want to keep forever. But I have a new Toyota Supra, the GR 2020 right now for the next three days from Toyota. And I love this thing. I built one for SEMA that was a pre-production car. So I never got to drive it. And it just basically like a show car and they'll crush it eventually. But Dude, this is a fun, it's a fun ride. Have you driven one of these yet? I drove the first gen or the, the one from last year. I yeah. liked it by itself if i go this if you just went this is a car okay and i drove it and i was yeah okay this is an all right car if you spent 53 grand on this you would get your money's worth and it's it's reasonably fun and quick and whatever but then it it just then i drove it for performance car of the year against all these other great cars and it sure. didn't really stand up next to the other great cars and then jason camisa started taking things off of it and he found 28 bmw badges without using a screwdriver and I was oh, like, that's oh, that's a little disappointing. And so it soured me on it a little bit. But I have the updated one coming in two weeks with the 385 horsepower engine. And then I get the four cylinder one after that. So uh, eyes open, optimistic for the update, which is what you're driving, right? The updated one. No, because I asked for it. and They said it was going out there to you. First. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> I swear. I swear. They're like, I mean, we have the 20, but the 21 is going out west first. Oh, no. Oh, you can have my cool. sloppy set seconds on it then dude i love it what <laughs> here's what i think is cool i've been battling people over instagram since i put the picture up um and i think that you can get this vibe and whether you feel this way or not it's totally cool the people that are like oh nice bmw has that z4 i just all i want to tell them is like guys i i hear you um but also if you ever drove a brz or an frs i just think you should shut up because to me they are low volume cars these are not the cars the manufacturers are making a bunch of money on these are cars for people like us that actually want to go and drive 
and have a good time. So I don't really care that BMW and Toyota worked on this thing together and then Toyota sent their own engineers to try to make it better. What I care about is that we have a car like this that doesn't need to be made and puts a smile on your face every time you drive it. Like that's, I just think this idea of people hating on, like I would never buy a Z4, would you? Uh, no, probably not. No, but I'll buy a Supra because I love the Supra and it's iconic to me. And then when I drive it, guess what? I don't care what factory the push rods came out of. Like it doesn't, it just doesn't matter to me. I, I totally get drive your it perspective. Have a good time, like I, I just think it's weird, man. It's, I, I get it. I think the problem, like, I here's the problem. Own- the one problem with it is it's a, it's a fine car, and all these things you're saying about it are right. Low volume, great that it got made at all. Is there really a difference what factory got built in? I totally get what you're saying. And like I said, if you went, here is a car, like it's a good car, right? But we're talking about the follow-up to the 2JZ engine. And it's the it's more importantly, it's the resurrection of a nameplate from the 1990s that stood for a car that got priced out of America because it was too expensive to make and sell here, you know, and it soldiered on in Japan for like four more years. So, yeah, I think it's a it was a car that was so an engine that was so good that it, the last time they sold it in America was 1998. And if you go to Formula Drift today, half the field is running those engines. So, oh, for sure. So that is why I think now, now you want to do the ultimate subversive fuck you to all those people, Rut? You're the perfect person to do it, as a matter of fact. If not you, Tavarish. But pro- I'll, I would sell it to you first. You get yourself a, a new Supra motor and drop it into your Mark IV. Mmm. BMW that would be- motor swap into a Mark IV oh, Supra. God. How do you connect the computers? And it would and make it even faster than a 2J. Then you shut all that people right now out. Now, here's what's funny, for the record. You know, and I do, I agree with what you're saying, because it is it is this huge nameplate. But you know, by the end of those runs, like, dealers were having trouble selling the 97s and 98s, number one, which seems crazy because the Royal Sapphire Pearl in a six-speed is still, like, that's my unicorn. Yeah. And one day I'll have that. But also the 2JZ wasn't seen at that time as the legendary engine that it is. It took years for people to get mm-hmm. there. Stefan mm-hmm. Papadakis has over a thousand horsepower out of that B58. So I'm with you on this just, too. The, the the it has not been proven yet that this engine isn't a 2JZ. I'm with you on right. that as well. But yeah. like listen, we got Lexus the Japanese in the 90s, we didn't know at the time that durability was a virtue, but it, it turns out in the long run, it was the virtue, right? The the yeah. one the one UZ in the LS400, the one and two JZ in the Toyotas, the Acura NSX, right? These are cars that by the end of their run sold in low volumes. But as it turns out, that durability really became the ultimate virtue. And, and that, I think, is what some of the more hardcore people are really looking for they don't necessarily just want another sports car they want the toyota of sports cars which i don't necessarily think that's what this is even though on its own it's a fine car would be like if yeah. uh, if they made a new if they took away the corvette for 10 years yeah and then they bring it back but they have an engine and they get the engine from Kia. McLaren, <laughs> Kia, like because the LS is the LS, right? right? It's the most reliable thing next to the 2J, maybe probably more reliable, makes more power. And because of that reputation for decades, mm-hmm. people go, well, the next one will have a, a small block Chevy. It'll be good. Yeah. And like all the Japanese cars for the most part in the 90s were like, what the hell oh, is that noise? We got some weird noise. <laughs> I think he's like making a coffee. Don't panic. Are you all right there, buddy? Are you fighting I'll, a giant I'll cricket? I'll be right back. Is there crickets? Can you mute his channel for a second? I mute. Rut, can you mute Rut, Rut's channel for a minute? There you go. Uh, when he comes back on screen, we'll go back to him. That was very. You're weird. right, though, Zach. Like BMW developed a reputation over many years of fragile engines that yeah. require a lot of looking after, and that reputation carries over into the current Supra for sure. Even and, and if Stefan Papadakis can go make a thousand horsepower and even if 335 BMWs from a couple years ago are out there at every runway race, totally. 
you know, putting up good numbers and making power, and and uh, he's back, and they're able to uh, modify. Sorry, you all right there, buddy? Oh, hi, sorry. No, there is there uh, there is some sort of wild animal that was just freaking out outside. Holy shit, that, that was an animal? animal? <laughs> I thought you had a feedback <laughs> problem. <laughs> wow. No, but I heard it, and I was like, yo, what is it? Is it, is it right there? Like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's cool. It's hilarious. Panic. No, That's the, hilarious. the funny thing to me, too, though, is I, I think – there's some sort of weird stigma that I I guess what I have trouble with is I've never I've never been a person that went out of my way to boo something else because I didn't dig it or I didn't understand it. And that was mm-hmm. that was honestly one of my hardest things about working in NASCAR early on is that like I remember saying to a crowd once, Hey, you know, we've got this driver coming out, people start booing. And I was like, Do y'all when you walk down the cereal aisle going to get two scoops, do y'all boo Cheerios on your way? Like, what's wrong with you guys? And so I think, I guess that's where my hang up is with this notion of two companies come together. So it must not be good for either one. And that's the part that I just sit there and go, I, I don't, I don't get that because I don't, there's so many cars as y'all know that are made that are, soulless transportation and they are not fun and if you have one i'm really sorry get, just get rid of it as soon as you can <laughs> Chevy i've bolts. had a ton of cars yeah like i've had a ton of cars that just sucked and that's okay like but now i have ones that i don't want to drive something that doesn't put a smile on my face or doesn't serve all these different purposes to me and i guess that's the part that i get confused about because like corvette guys this c8 is Dude, it's weird. To me, I sit there and I'm like, uh It is it's a little okay. strange, isn't it? A little strange that that's a Corvette. It's a nice car. It is it's fucking cool, but it's it is a little strange that that's the Corvette. Absolutely. And and part of that, you and I were in that era where, you know, there was a time period where the nicest radio in the S10 was the same radio you would get in this in the Corvette. Like yeah. we're not that far from that era. So it's just I don't know but like I don't love the new C8 but I would never walk by one and be like you suck go back to front engine like I don't know I yeah. guess that I, I, but I've also I don't have enough time to just hate on strangers for weird stuff so no I don't I don't hate on anything until I drive it if I drive it and it sucks that's a different story but I'll at least wait until I drive it and the super dri- I, super drives nice it does I do think what will be interesting is I want to hear what you think about the four cylinder in the super because the thing that i get is who is that for i'm not sure yet who is like oh i want a supra but i just don't want to go that fast i yeah i mean i i guess they're really trying to split the difference between the next gen 86 and the supra just in terms sure. of a price point and they probably need a little fuel economy a little bit of fuel economy in there and I hear that you can tune the hell out of that little four-cylinder BMW and make it go real fast. I've heard that this I is a good did. engine. For I know this. it's going to be rad, dude. For the yeah, record. it'll be cool. I, I think just, it'll be cool. Excited. I don't know. I mean, it's kind of like, hey, do you want an icy? Yeah, of course I'd love an icy. Do you want a, a medium or a large? Well, obviously, <laughs> if I'm going to have one, give me. I want a Gallo 16. Like, give me the big one. They should have called it the Celica. The name was right there the whole time, wasn't Ooh. it? It was right there. It would have been a safer move. It would have been a good move. We got a few questions from the audience. Oh, uh, Zach has organized them in a, a great fashion Thanks, for us. You're welcome, he is a guys. Clutch Sorry. player. Uh, what do we got, Zach? All uh, right, uh, Rutledge. What is your favorite station wagon? Ooh. Uh, you just you just dropped the CTSV. I did, but it's still no 96 Buick Roadmaster wagon, I can mm-hmm. tell you that. Which, which between the two, or is there another one? Uh, well, here's the thing. I, if it doesn't have a rear-facing uh, third-row seat where you can make obscene gestures at the cars behind you, it's not a station wagon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In high school, my friend, uh, I went to high school with the the whitest, the combination of the whitest people and the Jewiest people coming together. And the white, from the white faction deep into Connecticut, my friend Ethan Schwartz, who was also a Jew, uh, drove a 1989 Volvo 740 turbo wagon with a stick, which is the only one I have ever seen like it. 
Wow. And it was awesome. It was white with a tan interior, and that may have been the perfect wagon. With the with the That's Yakima awesome. the Yakima rack, ski rack on the roof. It was fucking dope. It was the shit. I, I did draw pictures in high school of a bluish purple volvo wagon that was down on the ground mm-hmm. so yeah that's a that's a close second mm-hmm. i mean like the one that um david letterman had that had the yeah. Oh, yeah hot rod wagons yeah real into that and, one and newman had the other yeah, yeah that's legit seinfeld i'll drop a name seinfeld drove that wagon and comedians and cars that's right and i talked to him about it i was like yo what's up with that fucking letterman's wagon he's like oh my god what a fucking piece of shit that thing <laughs> really yeah he hated it he said it was terrible Wait, he said did it he broke. not like it or did it no he said it broke yeah he said it was over he would overheat five, and it, it has five oh in it right yeah it had a five it had a, uh, um a five oh with a paxton novi supercharger on yeah it's not gonna non-intercooled work. centrifugal supercharger it was a different time <laughs> yeah, it's that's not gonna work right. at the time that was a big deal okay it had the entire jegs catalog <laughs> under the hood <laughs> But at, with like a Connecticut price tag, right? So right. Exactly. Insane. Exactly. Amazing. Rudd is the '96 Roadmaster the only car up until the McLaren Speedtail to use a covered rear wheel spat? Ooh. Was there another car after '96 where half the rear wheel was under the bodywork? Uh, I think Cadillac kept doing it, and. Oh, did Cadillac offer a, maybe oh, a guess, dealer maybe installed the on the Fleetwood? Yeah, but I don't know. But what I bet year. it wasn't. I bet it wasn't as deep as it was on the roadie because it was probably only like you know four yeah. inches or something. Yeah, yeah. The fleet. Oh, the Fleetwood had it. No, look, he's no. Zach, Zach was right. The Fleetwood had it, but I think it's the, the same year. I think that's like a ninety six. Ninety six. Yeah, yeah, same year. Same, same, same year. year. It had the LT one in that one too. I think it's the same car actually. Be, yeah, I think yeah, if you yeah, took a Roadmaster <laughs> wagon and just notched the rear window out, that's a Fleetwood. Absolutely. <laughs> there are a handful of roadie nerds who have taken the front end off that car and then. Made oh. Oh shit! Yeah. Cadillac. Yes. I'm on those kinds of boards for the record. Like, I'm, those are still the forums that I'm a part of. The Impala SS forum was pretty legit back in the day. What was the one, the forum that all those nerds in New Zealand used? Zach, TradeMe.nz. Yeah, uh, yeah, but that was like their eBay. It was like their eBay or Craigslist. There's some forum for oh. like. Oh shit! With a guy with the mods, like, like guys who build their own crazy stuff for them in in New Zealand. I got, we gotta find it and send it to you. It wasn't trade me. It was some other weird forum for wrenches to to find each other. It was really strange. Okay, what else you got, Zach? Um, If you guys had 120 grand to build a drift car, what would Mm -hmm. it be? What would it have? Rut. Uh, be a Mark IV Supra. It'd definitely be 2J powered. Um, I'd take it to Stefan Papadakis and then look for another 50 somewhere else to wipe everybody out. Uh, but I, I, I mean, that's, yeah, that's, here's what's crazy. The, the Formula D cars that are out right now, almost all of them are essentially nine or 10 second quarter mile cars that also can get sideways. They are so superior from where they were ten years ago. So I think you could honestly you could you could blow that money pretty quickly. Matt, yeah. what would you build? I mean, I would buy uh I'd buy Vaughn's car from last year. I mean I would just take that Mustang just right off his hands, set up as is, and be perfectly happy. I'd buy his demo car. Uh, you know what I mean? I'd buy his like yeah. take people for rides car and be like, Yeah, this is it. We're good right here. <laughs> I would, you know what? I, I might buy his old Fox body instead and just oh, put a hundred grand in your pocket and yeah. still go have the time of your life. Yeah. yeah. It was, I was tempted to go that way with my Fox body, but everyone I talked to was pretty much like, look, if you build a Fox body into a drift car, it won't do anything else. <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah. Dude, that thing turned out so cool. It did. I, do, you, and do you still keep tabs on where it ended up? You know, it's about to come up for sale again. The guy I sold it to, Drove it a couple times, but and then liked looking at it in his garage. But he's got like thirty cars, and he didn't drive it either. Sure. And so he's about to sell yeah. it again. And I'm not sure where it's going to go get listed for sale, but but it's going to come up. Uh, yeah, I, I think it was I did, awesome, man. It was, man. I I really it had the right attitude, it had the right look, and then I was very smart. It went on the cover of Carcraft magazine, and it went on Bring a Trailer a week later. <laughs> that was the move. Get out. <laughs> yeah, take it. Take yeah, it all. It's out yeah. of magazine, too. You got to come out. I mean, you're in Atlanta, so you must have had to go in one of Lee's safaris, right? Um, I got to drive Lee's safari. The red one. And, uh, yes. Isn't it and the best? It is, 
it's so much fun. What's funny about um, Lee's Safari and yours as well, Lee Keen that we're talking about that makes the amazing Safari 911. Here's what's crazy. I've had people that look like they want to fight me for my LS3 RWB. Like they're so angry about it. But then they can see Lee's redneck ass come by in a safari and they're like, see, that guy gets it. <laughs> y'all, y'all know they only built like four of those ever before they like, oh, okay, yeah, but I'm the one that's sacrilegious. Sure. It's, dude, yours is so pretty. I loved your car. Uh, that color was so nice. When you come um, to LA, you just, have to drive it. It's fun. Oh, I mean, you, you know what it, you're getting into if you've driven Lee's car, but it's, but it's, it's the best. It's just you smash speed bumps. You just don't give a shit. It's great fun. It really is. I'm trying to build that um, same notion. As you know, like that that whole, now people are taking that idea and they are trying to do it in their own way. It's not built the way that Lee does those cars and they do an incredible job. But I'm going to build a Corolla hatchback that is kind of like inspired, sort of like those Subaru cross treks uh-huh, but with a uh-huh. Toyota, Toyota Corolla hatchback I found. Dude, we see here in LA, it's starting to be very popular to get a cross trek. Lifted a couple inches, put some nice like fifteen fifty twos or some like rally wheels, and then like a skid plate in the front. I'm seeing them all over now. It's like the thing. Oh, These dude. sort of it's light just rally so cars. Fun to, yeah, and it's I mean any gravel road, and certainly in Georgia we have a lot more of those. It's just so much fun to have something that you're not so scared about driving all the time, and that's mm-hmm. why I wanted to make one. Dude, when it rains, and it doesn't rain here very often, but when it rains, I drive around the city like a complete dick bag i drift corners in the How city could you not i just don't care and it's i have the most fun it's a in loose surface my car turns in like a gt3 it's awesome <laughs> <laughs> it's, i mean your car the, i've got the roosters that your car will kick off the uh-huh. the <laughs> yeah just sheer panic to everyone yeah, yeah it's great it's great that rwb of yours though i love the sacrilege level there you got an rwb body you've got an ls motor what is that like to drive Dude, it's really fun. I, does it feel I like a Porsche was, still? What is it like? What does that feel like? I think it does. I mean, as you know, like the whole, there's so many different sides of uh, 911 ownership that I had no idea about. Um, so we built this with Continental Tire, built it at Kenwood Rod Shop that Randy's built some of the other things for me. But it was really the people that were around it that helped me in a, a huge way. Mark Arsenal uh, is the reason that I got, and Brian Scotto really got into RWBs. And uh, I knew that I was trying to build one. I actually started with the notion of building RWB 43. I wanted a petty blue um, RWB with 43 hand painted on the door and an old cup motor in the back. And I realized- A fucking NASCAR motor? Yes. (laughs) See, that's one of those things that seems like a good idea, but is not. It's not a good idea. Dude, absolutely. I started trying to figure out how I was going to make it work, and I was like, this this is an impossibility because Mm -mm. I couldn't, you know, those old cup motors and what they go through and how you have to make them, it just, it got, it snowballed so quickly, and I was like, this isn't going to work. So I had had an old Cobra back in the day, a Superformance Cobra that had a Bill Elliott practice motor in it that was detuned for 93 octane, and it was it seemed like such a good idea and then you On tried paper. to drive it and it was a nightmare it was horrible yeah 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 so you got an Absolutely. ls you, is this an e-rod so you got an ls no this is we started with an e-rod and then you realize like i'm not in california i don't need to have four cats on it so i took that back summit racing had the 525 horse ls3 oh, yeah, there you go. um and, and summit's been a great partner of mine and they're like this is ridiculous it's going to make people mad we're in and um yeah so then the tough thing was trying to figure out it, it started life as an 86 carrera i traded my corolla a86 drift car and some cash for it to a friend and it was very difficult because as you can imagine like porsche people didn't necessarily want to help with the project <laughs> There's such uh, except <laughs> one guy uh, whose name is Bill Rader. And Bill Rader has an amazing motorsports uh, company out in Las Vegas. He is the guy that makes uh, G-Wagons legit and insane off-road. He does oh. uh, a bunch of the squared ones, but he also is a huge 911 guy. And he built this G50 gearbox that I found on eBay. And I tell you what, if I needed he something... built Bill you a G50? Did you do yes, custom I- ratios and stuff? I, to be honest, I, don't t- I, I know we put a big-ass uh, billet 
LSD in there, uh-huh. and that was as much as I cool I paid attention to. So well, a G fifty is like you need that. That's a that's the that's the proper gearbox for that much power. You can't yes, a nine fifteen would just explode. And the best part is we started. There's one company out there. They're sweet people that they make some swap parts, but they used to make them for three fifties back in the day, and essentially just kind of upgraded their stuff. It's not it's not perfect for a car that I wanted to build a car that I could go thrash on. So we put everything in there and this sucker was so hot, Matt. There's just, there, obviously we put a water cooled engine in the back of an air cooled car. Yeah, yeah. Work. <laughs> it was so trying and so difficult. Where did the radiator end up? Power cord. Well, all three of them are up. Front. <laughs> Holy shit. Really? Yeah. Because we, we got one gigantic one and there just wasn't enough airflow. The kicker was it was fine at speed, but if you slow down or yeah. if you were in traffic, that's when it would overheat. Uh-huh. And I was like, this is the opposite problem of anyone who's <laughs> ever built a hot rod. This, this damn thing's going to kill me. So, so we ended yeah. up, um, we put two smaller radiators in on either side and, and shortened the original radiator they were using. And so we kind of daisy chained them together and used two electric water pumps to circulate everything. Oh my and God, now, it's so it, complicated. <laughs> it, it is. It's happy as could be. Um, it is... It's so fast that it kind of reminds me of the movie Spaceballs when they go <laughs> clad. Ludicrous speed, go. Yeah. Dude, it's, it's gnarly. It, does it, it have an interior we, of any kind? Does it have what? An interior? Yes. The interior is beautiful. Um, we did that cool guy, Stefan. Oh, it's the same kind of seats that are in your... Support. Oh, the GTS Classics? Yeah, those are good seats. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. They're awesome. They're very I good. I put a lumbar pillow in mine because I just I don't have a good enough... No, I'm with you, dude. Rocket. Shout out to the Tempur-Pedic portable travel pillow, which fits perfectly in the GTS Classic seats. Oh, I love your pattern. Ooh, That's a great interior, tartan. Man. Oh, thanks. Really nice Use tartan. Use uh, a Westphalia uh, kind of pattern mm-hmm. uh, from Relicate Leather, nice kind of brown, and then... Um, seatbelt planet by the way jake and the team over there are so rad i wanted like a cool belt but since continental was part of it and i do a lot of stuff it was like can we put their logo on there the guy's like absolutely wait there's so, a place that will make you custom seatbelt nylon like that yes they also can make plaid ones get the fuck out of here dude i swear dude your delica could have brand new everything oh like, my so god cool. you can send them everything <laughs> It's insane. Seatbelt Planet. And what's cool is that I've That's called in amazing. for some weird, weird projects. And I was like, fantastic. Yeah, we can have that on Tuesday. Like, oh, yes, dude. You, you so just much. up my seatbelt game so hard. I'm so ready. Do it. Do it on everything. Like, why not? But uh, here's what I can tell you. We had it tuned 493 to the rear wheel. <laughs> it was <laughs> Jeez, pretty man. intense. A little hard to drive. We had it retuned. Changed the torque numbers a bunch. It's now 463. And it is so... So much fun to drive. You got to drive. If you made it to Atlanta, I don't want you to drive. I'm owed. I owe. I owe several people. Of, I owe. I owe Sissio at top speed a visit. I owe Lee a visit. I need to go to. I need. There's a bunch of shit I got to do in Atlanta. Crown and Caliber. My watch sponsor is in Atlanta. Oh, yeah. Do you have the Kermit on right now? You still Kermiting? You Maybe. still Kermiting? Good for you. Every day. I haven't taken it off since the day I got it. You are a man of taste. It's got to be ten years at this point. At least ten years. They stopped making that yeah. watch in '09. That's right. I yeah. got it in 10 when I turned 30, and I just turned 40 a few weeks ago. Oh, so, yeah. congratulations, man. I like that. Thanks. A, a man who wears I'm his old. Kermit every day. That's good, good taste. It's a good time. I did that, too, until I had to sell a bunch of cars and use that money to buy a bunch of watches. <laughs> They're yeah. easier than cars. Sure. They are. Yes. Um, you know that speaking of V8s, uh, a couple years ago I drove one of the pro- possibly up until very recently the fastest Porsche I've ever driven was a 987 Cayman with a uh, Boss 302 Laguna Seca motor swap in the back. And it was 500 and wow. something horsepower. And it was basically like driving a Daytona prototype. I mean, it was, yeah. it was, it sounded like NASCAR and it went like crazy and it looked like a Porsche and it kind of felt like a Porsche and how it turned and stuff. But I mean, it was like, you know, it was like a Daytona prototype. The it was Ford crazy, GT. crazy. I understand. I, I just laugh and think, I'm not sure why these people hate this car so much. <laughs> You've never been near it or in it because you take one ride it and you're like, oh crap, this is. 
I yeah. think this is what they wanted them all to feel like. <laughs> I mean, look, I understand why a Porsche works well with a flat six engine and why my Porsche has a flat six engine. But I certainly would understand, having driven one especially, why somebody would go, we're going to need a little more torque here and, uh, and throw the V8 in the back. It makes sense. Goes faster. That's why. Because it's yeah. faster. Uh, Here's what's questions. crazy. Oh, I sold that 145,000 mile long block. I took it from a low ball from these dudes. That that nine grand is what that LS3 for 525 horse cost. So yeah. I just I did learn that the parts that people didn't like when I said I, it's a cracked out beetle. I did learn that. <laughs> no, I'd they're... say my bad, but I wouldn't mean it. The uh, we talk about this a lot on the show. Porsche air cooled horsepower is by far and away the worst value for money in cars absolutely <laughs> that's so, like that long shot i didn't i love when people like you ruined this car and all i wanted to write back was like bro you should have driven it like my wife sienna would smoke this thing <laughs> but because it's all oh, because it was made in germany i have yeah. to say like it's the greatest thing that's ever driven well it has it you know it's got a special feel you drive a 911 hard and it and it it feels when you rev an, when you rev a 911 close to red line for like an hour and it doesn't give a shit you go okay you know this is what's up but right. but also it's the, the if you wanted a f uh, the kind of power anywhere near what your car's got out of an air cooled engine that's a $300,000 engine like I just drove that right. Gunther Works thing, right? The 400R, that crazy. I can't 993. believe you drove it. Oh, that's awesome! It's batshit, right? It's completely batshit. Yeah. It's a 430 horsepower, four liter air cooled engine. It's a quarter of a million dollars just for the engine. That's it. No car, not even installed in the car. Just engine in a box. Two fifty. That's crazy town, bro. A junkyard Camaro is making that power number. <laughs> right. right. It just. But, but when you when you fire it up and you rev it to eighty five hundred, you go and you can feel the fizz. You go, oh, well, you know, if I had it, okay, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Uh, Zach, what else we got before we can let Mister Wood go? Uh, Rutledge uh, MC asks, how fun or silly is the NBC overnight crew when you're at Daytona twenty four hour? He, he likes all your shows and all your motors motorsport coverage. He just says uh, it seems like it's probably a barrel of monkeys doing that stuff. Like you've done so much live TV, which is challenging, especially the twenty four hour races. I know Parker Kligerman, and he is destroyed after he does overnight stuff. So how do you find it? Oh, it's nuts, man. First off, uh, thank you. Great questions uh, from everybody. I appreciate y'all watching everything. Uh, the Daytona 24 hour is is crazy. I've never seen anything like it. I've been to, to Talladega on Halloween and saw things that I thought I'd never see at a racetrack. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Daytona is funny because it's hardcore car people. It's the best uh, parking lot I've ever seen. I mean, the parking lots there are nicer than many car shows you go to and it's it's a really special thing but they're also really um they're really fun they like to party but they also love racing so sometimes you get kind of one or the other like if you go to a lemons race you see people that really love racing or they really love to party they don't always um and nascar is the same way there's sometimes people there that don't know there's a race going on but they are <laughs> knee deep in beer cans so yeah uh it's amazing. It's a it's a great group of people, but it takes a lot of people to go wide open like that, you know? Daytona's rough, man. I always mentally, every time I've gone, I've been like, it's Florida! And then it's freezing and it's raining. And I'm like, ah! But, yeah. Every time. And you could go back two weeks later for the 500, and you're like, did they move the race to Botswana? <laughs> yeah. It's so hot. I dance the moment I get out of the car. Like it just, That place has 90 different seasons in two days. I know. I know. It's crazy. All right. Um, all right last one might, might get you in a fight. It just says, uh, mm -hmm. would you rather have worked with Tanner or Dax, and then who would you rather have, have wings with? Would I rather work with Tanner or Dax? That won't get me if I, I I've not worked with Dax outside of the one time that we did it, uh, but we have become friends and, and work on cars when we can. Um, Tanner is one of my favorite people in the whole wide world because like the day he cut his hair himself in quarantine, I called and was like, hey, 
please don't do stuff like that in the future without asking me first. <laughs> I don't have that kind of relationship with Dax. And he was like, it, Tanner was like, dude, what do you mean, dude? Like, I said, um, I'm going to say this because I love you. It doesn't look good on you. That's not your thing. So I get that that was like week three. All these dudes are like, well, if I'm going to be home, bro, that's some people it's not our look. And you're on that list. And he was like, all right, fair enough. I uh, okay, am but- very fortunate. I can self groom anytime, anywhere. We're good. The bald man yeah. are, is. Oh my god, is that him with the, the quarantine hair? Know. It looks I'm awful. Looking. <laughs> I say that with love, guys. I, we've talked about oh, it, and funny. he knows now it's growing back. Yeah, up. but have you seen Chris Harris's quarantine hair? No. Is it? Is he let it grow Go, out? Pull up a picture, Zach. He's doing something. Up, I've been told it's for charity because I. I kind of crapped on him a little bit. Go down to the picture of him sitting in that convertible. He, it's oh, he's not mm-hmm. even on his Instagram. There it's just go. on his Twitter. He's got he's blonde. blonde. He's got blonde hair. Oh. He's the he's the real Slim Shady. <laughs> Please stand up. Look at him. <laughs> they're doing it, they're doing a chair. It's a it's kind of like bringing awareness to this, which is a air ambulance for Bristol, oh. Somerset, and other areas. Oh, um, so you paint your you head go. yellow because they're. Helicopters are yellow. Is that the thing? I don't. I'm not going to make fun green? of someone for doing something yeah. for charity, but I also am because it's Chris Harris. Uh, t- <laughs> and t- I make fun of friend, and so I make fun of November people friend. every year. November stinks. T- don't do Tanner it. Tanner gave himself principal hair. <laughs> like that's that's what it, he's the principal. He's got a little bit of a mustache. That, that's funny. Good <laughs> good way to put it. I would love to have wings with both of them. Tanner is not a great cook. I was. I cooked every meal last time I was there with them because uh, I like cooking. I have a cooking show coming out uh, this summer on Netflix. But, oh, can I tell you guys? June 19th, my new show is coming out on Netflix called Floor is Lava. It's an amazing show. If you like what? Wipeout. Floor what? is Lava? Oh, this is yes. a Wipeout-like show? Good for you. It's like Wipeout in that people bust their faces oh, open yes. over and over again. We started out making it a show for us, and I narrated it as such, right? I was there, I was the host, and it's me doing all the voiceover. And then they Is were like, Is this like a hey, most um, extreme elimination challenge type of show? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, it's it's going to be insane. Imagine like a 50 by 80 tank that's like six feet deep. It's the craziest, like, there's this these water jet cannons that blow up, Um and it's, dude, it's the slippery, it's the same stuff. Here's something dorky. Uh, do you remember in Ghostbusters 2 when they sprayed that stuff inside oh, the yeah. Statue of Liberty? Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. It's, it's the same stuff. It's called methicil, and it is a uh, food safe uh, chemical, wow. which scares me a little. Is it like a but gel kind of thing? Would it be like falling into a vat of hand sanitizer? <laughs> Mm-mm, no, dude. It's if you smell it, you slip and fall. Like, oh, it God. Is, I don't understand <laughs> what this stuff is made of, but there are so many people, and and there's ten grand on the line, and there's all these different kind of insane rooms. But it is a co-viewing show, so I had to go back and pronounce the planet Uranus correctly. Wait, it's wait. So it's a what viewing show? Co-viewing? Oh, it's like a co-viewing? What does that Meaning mean? Like. Kids and adults can sit and watch together. Oh, so shit. we had to take out all the Uranus jokes, and I said the planet Uranus once. Here's the difference <laughs> between me and Rutledge. I don't even get into invited to meetings where the word co-viewing would be brought up yeah. at all. That's like, Rutledge gets not, all dude, those I gigs. Really, I get none of them. <laughs> I wrote some really good jokes for the record that, that all got cut out the moment they said oh, that. Oh, I bet. Okay, so, but, do you get to uh, do you get I'll to watch do you get to watch their lap attempt and then you write the jokes like the same way they did for wipe because I thought the wipeout jokes yeah. were so under I mean they were a great part of the show but you were never really seeing the people saying them so if if you were so focused on watching people fall down you were missing such good burns that yeah. you couldn't believe yes. were on actual cable it's so good that's a great point dude when you see those like you sit there and watch you're like they wrote that's what a sick burn they just said, but I didn't see it because this chick looked like she just scorpioned herself. Yeah. Um, yeah, I hope it's that. Uh, I, what I love is that my kids can watch it and their friends will think I have a job because I'm on Netflix and a show they can watch, uh, which is great because none of their friends ever really understand, like, where's your dad? He's not here. It's really uh, funny. <laughs> <laughs> the best part is I go to my daughter's school to do stuff, and they're like, "Are you on YouTube?" 
And I was like, ah, I mean, I don't have like a chance. And they're like, oh, no. And they walk off. I know. Like, oh, My 10 year old nephew thinks I'm a god because I have a YouTube channel. And I'm like, He's you, not wrong. you could too. There's no barrier to this. <laughs> you don't understand. We're helping him out. I disagree. Not everyone could do this, and uh, only a few people are actually successful at it, and you're one of those, which is awesome. But Thank you. Not um, as successful as you because of co-viewing. <laughs> floor is lava. <laughs> no, floor is lava. When's June 19th? Is that what you said? 19th. That's yes, awesome. Yes, I would love for you all to watch it. Tell me what you think. And where do we petition, petition for season two of Hyperdrive? Who do I bother? We just need people to go watch. We need everyone to go watch and then watch it again and then just keep telling Netflix online that you want more of it. It was really good uh, treadmill viewing. I watched it at the gym and it made, made the time yes. go by like real fast. It's got really good pacing. I like awesome. Fit as a Fiddle, Matt Farah. I've really enjoyed this season of your life where you got uh, married this season of his life. wife. And got locked in, got locked in my house, so I lost weight because I just lived at the gym all day. Also, I love that you've like you really dug in on on making sure that you know how to cook and cooking new things. Everything, dude, it's been, you're gonna love the barbecue show I did. I'm really excited uh, for I, you. Do you are you are you nervous about transitioning into food? Like, do you have chef friends that are like, listen, don't fuck this up? You must have chef friends at this point that are that are putting well, the pressure um, on you to do this. Do I this did right. two seasons of a show called Southern and Hungry that my friend Guy Fieri produced. Oh yeah, I forgot right? about so, that. And I should have just called that "Rut Gets Fat for the Summer" because <laughs> that was fifteen pounds each yeah. season. Easy. You where can't you hang like, out with that guy, man. And with literally, he'll he'll fuck you up. Dude, it's guy is so much fun. You saw, like, uh, you got to go out there and celebrate Carl, and and my man is such a hard charger, and yeah. he also can still make it to the gym. And I was like, I can spell the word gym some days after hanging out with. with he is guy, a, but, he's um, like a proper motivator, dude. I I want I want like his 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 work ethic, his organizational abilities, his his ability to have nine things going at once and not have an anxiety attack every day. Like, I want all yeah. of that. You know, as do my it, he. We became friends. I met him at a racetrack because I knew he was there. He was at Sonoma, and I basically like went and stalked him. And I walked in, and he was like, "Oh, it's a weird dude from Speed Channel." And I had that moment of like, "Holy crap, that is Guy Fieri. He won Food Network Star." Yeah. And, you know, and we became we became friends. Have been friends ever since. And so I got to do a few guys grocery games. And I did one triple D here in Atlanta and he had me out there to do guys grocery games. He saw me sitting next to Damaris and here's why to your note about a tussle. He watched us for five minutes together and he came over at the first break and he was like, could you two do a show together? What? And we're like, absolutely. Oh, yeah. We, I'd never met Damaris. And he said, all right, um, at lunch, take the camera over there and tell me what you would make. Like what kind of show would you do? And we did on our lunch break. And that's what he took to food and pitched us that's and that's amazing. what had them buy the pilot off of that five minutes like he just is a guy who what a beast. believes so much in his friends and will hustle and do whatever he needs to do to make it happen you know when uh when carl when i went up to to see him with opie you know i it was sort of like oh yeah i'm you know i'm carl's friend matt i'm the car guy from la and it was sort of like oh cool yeah, yeah hi nice to meet you and he came back later and he was like I just realized who you were. You're that car guy. And, he, and then he, and then the next day I saw him again. And he's like, dude, I watched like 10 of your videos last night. Mad respect. We're going to make you super famous. The first thing you got to do is get a helmet that makes your face look better. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, it pinches your cheeks. We got to fix that. I was like, okay, they, they all okay do that. sir. Whatever you say, sir. Whatever you say. <laughs> He's just, dude, he is he is legit. And you've seen what he's done in this time, the amount of money he's raised for people in the restaurant industry. Like, he's oh, just, he is the greatest. That guy. reminds me. Uh, last year, we sold a T-shirt with Carl on it. And it said on the back that don't trust your own taste. Chances are you have none. The intention was to donate all the money from that to a scholarship that was set up in Carl's name. It turns out for a variety of reasons that in order to donate that money to that scholarship, it would have to go through a GoFundMe who would take that would take a third of it. So we were right. not really about that. And then the coronavirus happened and and Guy set up this restaurant workers relief fund. We diverted the money and we believe this is in accordance with what Carl would have wanted. 
we diverted twelve thousand dollars all of it to guy and to their foundation That's awesome so that <clears throat> money will go directly to um five hundred dollar payments to um furloughed and laid off restaurant workers and we think if carl was alive and he had an opportunity to either set up a scholarship for a chef or to make sure the dishwashers in his kitchen eat dinner that carl would have done that and so that's what we did so we get that happened Absolutely. last week we gave the money to guys restaurant uh, relief foundation so dude yeah. that's awesome so, i miss carl's one of those guys that i i um, I got to meet him doing guys grocery games and, and he had been a big top gear fan. It was just, he was one of those guys that was the most eclectic and sweet and warm and smartest dudes I ever met. And, and he's also one of those people in your life that when you are lucky enough to meet a person, um, like Carl, make friends with him, you also realize that the moment that he's gone, this absence that can never be filled because there's yeah. no one else that will ever be like him. Yeah. And, Dude, his goofy stuff every single day. And the last thing we were texting about was um, I'd never been to Rut's Hut, and he always wanted to take me. And uh, he's like, dude, next time you come up, we're going. We're going to have a great time. I'm in. Let's do it. And uh, that's a that's a really special thing y'all did, man. I think he'd be really proud. He um, he, he left a massive hole when he was gone. And Guy, to his credit, at the memorial, I said to I said to Guy, like, look, you know, whenever I had a food question or food, I, I could always, Carl always had the answer. And Guy gave me his number, and he goes, I got you there. So now I can actually, when I have a stupid food question, I text Guy Fieri, and he gets back to me in, like, 30 seconds. It's crazy. Absolutely. It is crazy. I can't believe it. But Carl, like, every time I hung out with Carl, he made me laugh my face off. He taught me something really interesting about life, and he introduced me to at least one person that was almost as interesting as he was every single yep. time. And I'd never, I've never met anyone like that before or since. Um, That's awesome. It was incredible. Rut, thank you for your time, man. It was really good talking oh. to you. It's been too long. I'm glad we got to do this. It was great. Totally. Thanks for having me. You're. It's so cool what you have built and all the hard work that it's taken to get here. I'm speaking to Zach, not to Matt. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But it's just, it's awesome, dude. You you inspire so many people, and the amount of conversations I've had in places about you are just so cool, and I hope you know how much uh, you matter. You oh, man, that's so nice of you. Thank you so much. I'm glad that you appreciate it, because I, I, I look up to your work a lot as being doing doing the kinds of gigs that families can watch together. So, <laughs> pe so people like me can be in this dark corner of the Internet and have you message me in the morning going, look, man, I'm really stoked for the show, but don't make me lose my job. <laughs> Please. I said I said very carefully. I had to ask permission. Please don't let me get fired on your show. And Matt's like, I got you. No, nah, we I won't. We will not. We will not. Dude, Thanks. dude, floor is lava. Go watch Boys, Hyper Drive. NASCAR on NBC is coming back in July. NASCAR is back now. Everybody needs to go watch Fox. It's it's wild. It's crazy. Let's go to a race sometime together, you and me. Oh, my God. I'd love to. And I've got to get one of the suits from your guy. I, I'm going full suit. We're you doing need it. to. I can... I can see one over here. We're gonna get you one. I know. I'm going. I'm going hard at the paint when it comes to these suits, for sure. That's what I'm talking Thanks, about. Thanks, Rut. For the live folks, uh, stick around. Don't go away just yet, Rut. Uh, for the live folks, uh, big week next week. Tuesday, Doug Demuro. Wednesday, Freddie Tavares Hernandez. Thursday, Craig Lieberman, the vehicle coordinator from the Fast and the Furious. And those three shows will wrap our old studio. And then we pack it up and move across the street to Westside Collector Car Storage. Thank you all for listening. We will see you then. The Smoking Tire Podcast is powered by Shout Engine. Get your own damn podcast at ShoutEngine.com. It's easy. All you need is a microphone, a connection to the internet, and ideally, some famous-ass friends.